So there's a CTF set up for this workshop that is separate from the conference CTF. So if you go to if you go to vacr.io slash workshop, uh, you can log in there. And this is if you want to kind of play along, right? So this this workshop is intended to um, uh, um, introduce the notion of a CTF and introduce some different kinds of CTF challenges and how to approach the CTF challenges. Uh, we'll cover some some pretty um, kind of be, beginner level stuff and and we will get into some you know maybe some more intermediate things along the way. Um, so um, so if you've done a CTF before, um, you you're hopefully should still get something out of this session. Um, if you've never done a CTF before, then this should be great. It, it's really meant to to get folks. Um, into try at least trying out a CTF. Um, so if you again, if you want to play along, then um, you can go to vacker.io slash workshop. And you should see the um, the, the, the uh, labeled number one here in the upper right hand corner, the CTF workshop screen, you click start. And then you can log in using an open ID provider. Um, Google is is usually works the best, but you can also use Facebook or Azure. And then um, once you get logged in with your open ID provider, you'll see a, a sort of a blank screen and it'll, it'll give you the option to play solo. And um, <clears throat> so the way that the cloud CTF platform works, you can play by yourself or you can play in teams and the administrator can, can change that, uh, um, sort of make it so you, can, so you can set up teams or not. And I have this one set up to not have team play because I think folks are probably remote and, and maybe just working through things on your own is a, is a great way to approach this. But um, I'm going to show you later on as we get towards the end here, I'm going to, I'm going to show off some of the sort of the back end, some of the administrative features of the cloud CTF platform. And um, when I do that, I'll show you how to make those different configuration uh, changes. Uh, there's also a, uh, a, a cyber range um, environment available. And so if you go to vacker.io slash range and then uh, click on the um, I have an invitation code button and um, put in this invitation code. I probably could automate that whole thing, Holly. I didn't, I didn't think of that. But, um, but you can put in this invitation code and, um, and then you log in through uh, an open ID provider again uh, and um, you'll get access to a, a virtual environment in the Virginia cyber range that you can use to, uh, to, to work on challenges. If you want to do that, that, that piece of it is a little bit more optional, even than the, than logging into the CTF. We're going to go through, um, you know, we're going to, we're going to go through some challenges and uh, you know, you can, you can solve these using uh, Linux or windows. A lot of them, you can solve them using Linux or windows. Um, uh, so, um, you know, I would I would say that you know if you want to use a Linux system for some of this, you can. If you don't if you don't want to go down that road, then then uh, you don't need to do that. Um, hey Dave, hey Dave, this is Ellen. I hate to interrupt. I can't yeah. do the chat, but is everybody able to get into that CTF? Because I'm getting a you cannot create a user, you cannot create a player error repeatedly. Um, is anybody else having that trouble? Let me look at it. Yeah, I posted the uh, error in the chat. Yeah, this is Mike Onda. I didn't have an error, but I think it's because I had to create an account from scratch because I don't have my uh, original CyberRange account. I wonder if that's where the issue is when you're um, trying to you know, do your login. If you already got an account, it doesn't let you. Uh, that shouldn't matter, actually. Let me look to make sure I don't have it configured improperly. I could have screwed it up. I, I've been trying to do um, three or four things at once over the weekend. And, uh, so I'm going to take a look here. Allow registration, allow approaches. Yeah, so this should be set and ready to go. Um, so what error are you getting, Alan? I can't it see says, the chat. Um, 
error. Let me do it again. It, it clicks to, I click on my um, Gmail account, and then it spins and spins. I'm doing it again. Loading, loading. I get player options. I click player solo, and then it kind of acts like it's going to do something, and then I get an error. Cannot create a player. Oh, it's I'm in now. Now I'm in. I don't know. Now it says challenges will appear in eight minutes and fifty seconds. Okay. okay. So you did something. <laughs> I didn't do anything, but um, but but, <laughs> but maybe our AWS backend is catching up with a, a whole bunch of load that they didn't have uh, ten minutes ago. <laughs> so I think it's the standard IT troubleshooting where it starts working as soon as you get the help desk to look at it. Yeah. Yeah. Yep, I was looking at it, so it probably just fixed itself. <laughs> Okay, so uh, so I guess if you're having challenges, then that, or if you're having problems getting logged in, then then just sort of try it again. Um, there are some basic troubleshooting steps you can take if you're having trouble with login. You can you can use a in private browser. That's usually the best thing because sometimes there are plugin there are browser plugins or other things that can get in the way of of the Open ID login process. Um, uh, but um, it it really should work, and I. I I mean, I feel pretty good about this. I did I did a CTF last week, part of our beta test. I did a CTF last week with with about 100 um, high school students, and and um, every student got in except for one, and it was pretty clear that that student had a had something blocking his access um, where he was located. Um, so okay, and we have Lee Dowdy on the on the line here, who's our um, one of our he's he leads our cloud architecture effort and um so if, if people have trouble then uh, chat messages might uh, lee might be able to poke around and see what problem you're yep. having. I, I did want to remind people um the the whova chat is enabled for for discussion if you want to chat in the whova app that's available and i will definitely be monitoring that <clears throat> okay so i'm going to move on from this slide um, if you need the if you need the um, deets here, I'm going to give them again in just a second. So I'm going to get kicked off here. Sorry for the delay. Uh, give me one second, actually. <clears throat> Okay, so we're going to start out with um, with basically you know some some intro, getting things set up, so some prep, um, and and we've kind of been doing that right now, getting logged into the CTF. And if you want to get logged into a CyberRange account, then you can do that. If you already obviously if you're already a Virginia CyberRange user, then just use use a course that you've already got. We and we can we can um, you know you can jump into uh, a Kali Linux VM and and use that, so you don't have to necessarily use my course. I, I just provisioned a. a, a um, I just provisioned a basic um, uh, Kali Linux virtual machine that you can use if you want to use it if you don't already have already have access to one. So we're going to give some uh, brief overview intro of Capture the Flag. We're going to give some general challenge solving tips, sort of very high level, and then we're going to go category by category through the sort of the most most common categories, and we're going to talk about how to approach these different kinds of challenges and what kinds of things you'll see. Um, and then we'll talk about hosting your own CTF. So I'll point you to a bunch of resources that you can use to host your own. And then um, I'll talk a little bit about some of the features of the cloud CTF platform from the Virginia Cyber Range. And um, you know, this is intended to be workshoppy and not necessarily uh, um, you know me just talking for for um, you know two and a half hours. So please uh, uh, stop me along the way and chime in, ask questions. Um, I'm, I'm happy to sort of take things down a different path for a few minutes here and there, if that would be helpful to people. Uh, and we'll also, um, we'll also, uh, take a, take a, a breather here and there so that we can, um, not stare at a computer screen for two and a half hours straight. So most of the approaches <clears throat> I'm going to demonstrate will use, um, We'll use Linux. I don't know. Maybe not most of them. A lot of the a lot of the approaches that I'm going to demonstrate are going to use Linux. Um, you can use Windows too for a lot of these, um, and and I'll talk about equivalent approaches um, where that makes sense. Um, you know, lots of the software we're going to look at uh, is available either in Linux or Windows. For example, Wireshark. If you're going to do networking challenges, Wireshark is the tool of choice uh, for most of these, and that's a tool that's available for any platform, uh, Windows, Linux, or, or Mac, and it's a free piece of software. Um, the only things that you really have to use Linux for are 
um, we're going to look at some uh, uh, reverse engineering challenges, and we're not going to we're not going to delve deeply into reverse engineering because that, that's like you know we, we could teach a whole course on that. Um, in fact, I've been to courses on that, uh, but um, but uh, it, the, the the challenges that are uh, executable programs uh, are best um, in a Linux environment because these are Linux executable programs. Now, if you have the Bash, if you have Windows with the Bash uh, um, or the Ubuntu installed, then then um, you could run them over there. I think uh, you should be able to run them over there. So so again, um, if you're if you're more comfortable in Windows, then use Windows. Um, so again, we'll take breaks along the way. Practice this practice CTF is only for this workshop. So these are some challenges that are. I mean, if, if you've done one of our CTFs before, some of these challenges you'll, you'll have seen before, maybe all of them you'll, you'll have seen before. Um, uh, but but it's sep this, this one is different from the conference CTF. So the conference CTF is at backer.io slash CTF. This one is at backer.io slash workshop. And, um, and so the, the way to make it obvious is this CTF has um, sort of a plain white background and the conference CTF is, is a little snazzier. It's got some graphics in the background. And that's one of the cool features of the Cloud CTF platform is, is it, it's skinnable to a certain extent. And so you can, you can change the theme. And we'll introduce more themes uh, over time. OK, so these are those resources again. And so I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to try to log in here. Let me go to. Um, So I'm going to create account. I'm going to create a player account. So I obviously I have an admin account in this CTF, but I'm going to create a player account. Workshop. I'll just walk through this plot process. So here's the splash page. I click start. It's going to ask me to sign in, so I'll use Google. And pick one of my handful of credentials. Uh, so again, on this screen, all you get today is play solo. Um, if, the, if the CTF was set up for teams, then you would get another option that says create a team and then a third option that says join a team. And if you, and if you join a team, then you select from a dropdown of existing teams. So what you can tell your students is, um, you know, you can identify the teams, you can, you can identify team leaders to create the teams, and then the other uh, uh, people in the team just join the team. So I'm going to play solo. And this is all going to work perfectly. Very confident. <clears throat> there we go. Look at that. We get it in 52 seconds. So, in, so for the CTF, you can set the start time so it starts automatically. I have this thing set for 9:30, and then you can set the end time, and so it'll stop. This CTF will stop. I think maybe at noon, uh, maybe 12:30. I don't remember what I set the cutoff time for, but but th this CTF is going to go away after this workshop. Um, unless people want me to leave it on. But really, if, if you're going to play more CTF stuff, then I really encourage you to go to the conference CTF. There's lots of challenges there. Wider, wider uh, experience level, so there's even easier challenges there than you'll see in here. And uh, obviously, some much more difficult challenges. And uh, in the conference CTF, there's potential to get, to get prizes at the end. All right, I'll go back to my slides. <clears throat> so that's how you get logged into the, to the CTF. Okay, so um, so capture the flag. What is capture the flag? So um, capture the flag is a cybersecurity competition and uh, can be individual or team based. Sometimes in person, they're often remote. So one of the cool things about capture the flag, at least the kind of capture the flag we're going to look at here, is um, you can you can participate completely remotely, right? So you can have a, a group of students, a club or a team. And it's a very inexpensive proposition because the students don't have to travel somewhere for the most part to participate in a CTF. For, for lots of them, they can participate remotely. Even in the CTFs where they bring everybody together, that, that's really just for the, you know, just sort of make it 
more of an interactive experience. Really, the students are going to play the CTF usually just using it, you know, through a website. So, um, so uh, these, you know, there's lots of remote CTFs that that students can participate in, both high school and college students and professionals. And I'll point you to lots of those um, as we get towards the end of the workshop. And there's various formats. Jeopardy style is, is probably the most popular and it's certainly the easiest to set up, right? So we have this Jeopardy style CTF platform that um, you know, it took, a, a, took a pretty significant amount of effort uh, on the part of the DevOps team to create this thing. But for, for a teacher who wants to use it, it's very easy to set up and get, get it going and, and to get your students involved. Um, if you're gonna run a, some sort of an attack defend CTF, um, you know, where you have where you have networks, different networks, and you have students, you know, d defending their own network while they're attacking somebody else's. Those are um, those are really cool and interesting. Those are generally for much more advanced students, and um, it take it's it's just it takes a lot of time and effort to set those up, and and um, so Jeopardy style is is uh, you know the way to go at least for sort of entry level CTF players. Um, <clears throat> Okay, and who hosts these? The CTFs are hosted by um, college CTF teams. So, um, you know, there's lots of, of college CTF teams in Virginia. In fact, you know, most of the most of the colleges and universities have some sort of a CTF team. Um, I, I'm the faculty advisor for the for the Virginia Tech Cybersecurity Club, and they participate in lots of Capture the Flag, and they also host an annual Capture the Flag competition in the spring. Um, they have this annual cybersecurity summit and they and they bring in uh, students from colleges uh, around Virginia and also from surrounding states. So we've had students uh, participate from, uh, you know, from Tennessee and North Carolina and Maryland and uh, other places. Um, companies who are looking for talent also host CTF. So you can find CTFs hosted by like Facebook and Google. And really that's about them trying to identify um, you know, potential future talent and they, um, they uh, you know, run these CTFs and uh, the, the students who are the winners get often get some perks out of it. So I've had students who have had, um, who have participated in some of these and have gotten trips to, um, to the Black Hat Conference out of it uh, for doing well on the, on, uh, on a, I think it was the Facebook uh, CTF. Um, and then, you know, they, they sort of, keep track of those students and, and uh, you know, maybe try to recruit them to work at their companies. And then the DOD and other government agencies run CTFs. A lot of those are, are sort of focused on the DOD, but some of them are, are more open. And, um, and then you can also host your own CTFs and we'll talk more about that later on. Um, <clears throat> the, these competitions are a great way to spark interest in cybersecurity topics. And, and again, they're, they're very popular among, among college uh, cybersecurity clubs and teams. They're getting more popular amongst high school clubs and teams. Um, if you look at Cyber Patriot, which is kind of sort of a CTF, um, it, it, you know, it's, it's a cybersecurity competition. Um, that's, that's become very popular. And um, some of these Jeopardy style CTFs are becoming more popular in K-12 as well. Things like Pico CTF and, and Radford University's Are You Secure CTF. A, a CTF is really intended to, um, to, um, get students to teach themselves things. And, you know, it's all about, you know, it's, it's really intended to be a learning process, right? So, so, so if somebody who creates a, a well-designed CTF, first of all, it caters, it'll cater to a wide range of ability levels. So you have very beginner players, oftentimes up through players who've been doing this for four years and they're sort of the, the expert on their CTF team. And, and so, you, you know, you, you want to have challenges that will cater to that whole group of people. You want newbies to, have some success and get some points and, and you know sort of be pleased with themselves for for doing that and then you want the more experienced players to um, to have to work to, to solve some challenges right if they're not learning something new then I, I think the CTF is not very not very um, effective or well designed they really are intended to encourage independent learning so you, so that uh, as I mentioned we want the students to learn new things along the way and then um, that we want them to exercise some real world skills. So, you know, you, you, the, the, the things that they should be learning are things that they might apply later, later on as a cybersecurity person. So, you know, if you, if you have 
networking challenges where they have to dig into packet captures and, and use Wireshark to identify, um, you know, different ports and protocols and IP addresses and, and et cetera. Um, you know, th those are all skills that help them understand more about networks and how networks function. Um, I, I, I had a, a CTF team uh, um, at West Point, New York. I created their competition team there several years ago, and we, we um, participated in, in an annual CTF called the, the uh, Cybersecurity Awareness Week CTF hosted by NYU Poly. And the way that, so that's one of the biggest collegiate CTFs um, in the country. It's, it's part, you know, yeah, yeah, there are hundreds of colleges and universities that participate in that CTF. And there's a, there's a qualification round usually in September, then they have a final round in uh, November. And the, um, the top 10 qualifiers um, are invited to the final round and they get an expense paid trip to to Brooklyn to NYU Poly and they participate in the in the live uh, final round and um, the, the West Point team uh, went to that final round um, again this was five or six years ago and um, one of the challenges had had a um, industrial control system component so they had they had um, this array of programmable programmable logic controllers uh, connected to a to a SCADA system, and um, you know the the my CTF team they had never done anything with industrial control or SCADA or, or PLCs or any of that, and um, and they learned it in in a weekend, and they were able to solve these these uh, uh, cybersecurity challenges in in a an industrial control sort of environment. So it's that kind of thing that really you know requires the students to to learn something new and to expand their horizons. And um, a well-designed CTF, I think, does that kind of thing. And then um, CTFs are used for a variety of purposes, right? Team, team building events, skills assessment. You can use these in class. I know, if, I know of educators who will have a CTF set up for their class, and um, you know they'll, they'll do like CTF Fridays, right? So they'll teach some concepts for a couple of weeks, and then they'll have a capture the flag uh, um, event, you know, in class on a Friday, where, where they'll have questions around the things that were covered. Um, during that during that block, so that's a good way to, to use them, I think. Um, okay, so that's that's why CTFs are cool. This picture, I like this picture. This this um, let me go back up here. Sorry, this photograph is um, from last year's, um, so not 2020, but 2019 uh, um, Virginia uh, Virginia Tech Cybersecurity Summit. And this is 130 college students from three states at about eight o'clock in the morning on a Saturday, all converged on an academic building at, on the Virginia Tech campus. And, um, and they're doing a thing that looks like schoolwork, but, but really they're participating in a CTF, right? So those, those guys in the front of the room are um, the, the, the president and the, and the vice president of the Virginia Tech Cybersecurity Club. And, um, I don't know, I think it's cool to see this kind of energy where you have this, this bunch of students who traveled, spent the night, you know, came on campus early in the morning to participate in the CTF for the entire day. And, and um, you know, there's no big prizes involved. There's some tchotchkes that, that some sponsors hand out and there's some bragging rights that the winners get. But, um, you know, these, these students are just fired up about it and they want to come and, and compete. So I'm a huge fan of CTFs. So this is, um, just sort of a typical Jeopardy style CTF board. This is an old one from uh, um, NYU Poly back in 2012. Um, and I just put this up to, to you know, point out um, the, the, what's maybe already obvious, what Jeopardy style means, right? So it's, a, it's challenges across different categories with various point values. And, um, and higher point values are generally more difficult challenges. That, that's kind of the, the standard. Uh, way that it works. <clears throat> so um, some, co some, some common challenge types, just a quick overview here, and then we'll delve into each one of these. So trivia is, is fairly obvious. And trivia challenges might be labeled trivia, or they might have some other name, right? So th they might um, have a name that evokes some topic like Star Wars or sci-fi or, or whatever. Um, uh, but you know, the, the they're, they're, they're just it's sort of basic trivia, right? Um, cryptography, those are challenges related to different encodings or, or ciphers. Um, web challenges have to do with um, 
things hidden in web pages, or maybe you have some vulnerable web application or something, something related to uh, the web. Um, reconnaissance challenges are a bit of a catch-all. So recon challenges are, are usually um, this situation where the, the, the participant has to sort of follow a trail of clues, you know, to, to, to get to the solution. And, you know, the, the, the low point value challenges will, will have a short trail and the, the higher point value challenges will have, have you know, significantly uh, more, you know, number of steps that have to be completed. Um, networking challenges, um, uh, th these are really intended to make students comfortable doing things like network protocol analysis or, or network traffic analysis. And um, so what you might have is captured network traffic, or you might have you might have live network traffic. So we've done some CTFs where we've had live network traffic and the student has to, has to discover things in there. So those are those are challenges related to networking. Um, forensics challenges are um, related to digital forensics, right? So you might have some digital artifact like a like a hard drive image or a or a mobile device image, and you have to you have to be able to dig into that artifact and, and find some sort of a flag. Uh, and then reverse engineering, or sometimes you'll hear this referred to as binary exploitation. Uh, the, this, these are the like the high-end, very difficult challenges. And um, this is this the, this is the, you know the, these kinds of challenges are things that you'll see more in like a collegiate capture the flag competition. Um, you know th these are students who have had maybe a computer science course, even like a computer organization course, um, and maybe even an assembly language programming course. Um, you know, to, to do well in reverse engineering challenges, you generally have to have um, more than an introductory, uh, um, you know, sense of computer science and, and computer engineering. We are going to take a look at some entry level reverse engineering challenges during this workshop, but um, but as you get into the to the intermediate ones and the more difficult ones, you really have to um, have have a pretty good handle on things. Um, okay, so any questions on any of that was all sort of introductory material. Any questions along the way? Any more trouble getting logged in to the CTF? <clears throat> okay, so um, let's look at some general tips for solving CTF challenges. So um, <clears throat> First one may be obvious, point values indicate difficulty level, right? So, um, so um, you know, low point value challenges usually equals easier problem, high point value challenges usually equals harder problem. I would say though that occasionally you run into a situation where the creator of the challenge thinks that it's more difficult than it is or vice versa, right? So, so um, assigning a point value to a challenge it is, um, you know, it, it's, it, you have to just sort of have a sense for how hard it is and, you know, how hard it is really depends a lot on what you know and what you don't know. And so, um, so I, uh, I don't know, it just, it really depends, you know, some, some uh, people in, and I'll also say that the points are all relative, right? So, so an easy challenge in one CTF might be a hundred points, whereas a CTF in another uh, an easy challenge in another CTF might be five points, right? So the points are all relative to each other. And, um, you know, in our, in our CTFs, the point values range usually from like five, five points or so. Those are like the really easy challenges up to like maybe up to like 200 points. And those are, those are the much more difficult ones. And, um, and, uh, and again, the challenge difficulty level is, in the mind of the creator of the challenge itself. And sometimes the creator of the challenge uh, doesn't know some thing that, that might help them solve a challenge that otherwise would be very difficult, right? So, um, so I, I would caution, you know, even if you, even if you see a challenge that, that's worth way more than you think you, you're capable of, it's worth just taking a look at it and seeing if that just happens to be a thing that you know how to do. And, um, and if it is, go for it. Um, so the, the name of the challenge, the name of the challenge is almost always a hint. And, um, you know, you get a feel for that as you do more of these CTFs, but, but, um, um, you know, the challenge name usually points you in a certain direction. And if you Google the category along with the name of the challenge, so if you have a networking challenge and then, you know, you, you can Google networking and then the name, and that might point you in a good direction. 
and you know that's if you're sort of clueless, you're not not sure what to do. Um, and and I'll, I'll say that challenges are often a little bit um, ambiguous, right? So that you don't often have a lot of information. You have to put, you know, part of the challenge is figuring out just exactly what you're what you're supposed to do. Certainly, you should always read the challenge description carefully if there is one. And you know, again, if you're not quite sure what you're supposed to do, then um, then Google the category again, along with some of the keywords in the description. You know, so there, there's lots of, you know, there's often sort of between the lines kinds of um, writing that goes on in the in the CTF uh, challenge description. So you got to sort of read between the lines and try to sort out what they're trying to say. Um, if there's a file, <clears throat> the name of the file might be a hint. So look at that. Look at the file name. Might even Google the file name. Um, if there's a, so so one sort of trope of CTFs is um, you know and if this is particularly true for maybe some of the entry level challenges is the, um, the the challenge creator will will either strip the file extension or they will change the file extension right so um, you know that will. Um, you know, so that, that will, like in Windows, if you pull down this, the file in Windows, if it's a .doc file, but you change the file extension to .xls, then, um, then the, the, you know, you click on it and you're going to get an error. And so, um, and if you have Windows set up so that you don't see the file extensions, then um, you, you're, you may be sort of clueless as to, as to why you're getting that error. So, um, so again, it's a, it's a little bit of a, um, it's a little bit of a trope to, to change or to remove file extensions from files uh, um, that, that are downloaded as part of a CTF. So, um, you know, I, I, I almost always use Linux when I'm doing CTF challenges and any file I pull down, one of the first things I do is I run, is I run the Linux file command against it and that tells me what it is. Um, <clears throat> another thing you do is run the Linux strings command against it. So if you have a file run strings here, I, here this example, is um, running strings against a file. So this is a this is a CTF challenge file that's called strings, right? So that's intended to to um, you know maybe sort of confuse the, the CTF player because strings is a Linux utility, but this is a this is a CTF challenges and the file name that's downloaded is called strings. Um, so so here I'm running the Linux utility strings against a file called against this file I downloaded called strings and um, you know here's the flag so um, so run strings against it sometimes words will fall out in in the you know what the strings utility does is it is it um, prints out uh, um, sequences of five or more ASCII characters to the terminal window and we'll take a look at that in a few minutes but um, that's often a, a way to easily identify a flag in, in some kind of a file that you, that you have. Um, you, can just, you can just sort of, um, you know, open the file, cat the file, uh, look at it, see what the contents are. Um, maybe you can open it in a hex editor. So we'll take a look at a hex editor later on in this, in this uh, workshop and we'll see what files look like in, in hex editors. Um, you can also just run the file, right? So, so um, when we get to the when we get to the reverse engineering section, we'll, we'll we'll sort of go through the steps that you would normally do when you have a file in a CTF challenge, and you know that's you know I, I basically always take the same few few steps because it's really quick and easy to run file and to run strings and to cat the file and to run the program and see what it does, and um, and oftentimes that that bears a lot of fruit. Um, if there are any names mentioned in the in the um, in the challenge description or in the file name or whatever, the names are usually meaningful, right? So it's like if you have a cryptography challenge and there's some person's name, it's often some sort of famous mathematician or something. And, and that might lead you towards towards a solution. Um, and it, it's it's important to keep in mind that <clears throat> when you enter this, the, the flag, um, you your flag has to match the thing that is in the, the head of the creator of the CTF challenge. And, um, and if, your, 
if you're um, the thing that you enter, if it doesn't match, then it's going to tell you that you're wrong. And really, you may be, you may either have the right answer or you may be on the right path, but um, but the, uh, the the CTF system is telling you you're wrong, and it could just be because your capitalization is is different than the person who created the challenge, right? So maybe they capitalized the first and last name, put a space in the middle, maybe they didn't, and so that's causing you problems. Now, if you if you do if you're if if you're an experienced creator of CTF challenges, then there are ways you can you know you can like our system allows you to use these things called regular expressions that that sort of match all kinds of different entries that are close to the same thing. And, um, and I, I'm going to show you that later on when we get into the, to the back end of, this, of the cloud CTF system. Um, but just keep in mind that if you put in a thing and you're pretty darn sure that that's the right answer, but, you, but the CTF system is telling you that you're wrong, then I, I suggest that you do things like, you know, change the capitalization or, you know, take out the spaces or, you know, just do things to change the format of your, of your um, flag that you're inputting and, and you might get some better results. Um, okay, so that, this, that's, th those are high level tips on uh, how to approach CTF challenges. And these are useful for any, just about any challenge. Um, I should mention that these slides are uploaded to Whova and um, so you should have access to these slides. Um, and there, there's a PDF that I guess it's, it's um, hopefully it's right along with the session, um, but you can download these and, and um, play along. Or download them after the fact. <clears throat> okay, so, um, oh, this session is also being recorded so you can watch it later. You can fast forward to the dry parts. Okay, so, um, so we'll get into some specific types of challenges and trivia, I'm just gonna go through very quickly. I'm not gonna do any, um, I don't think I put any trivia challenges in this workshop CTF. I just wanna cover this very quickly. Um, trivia challenges can encompass a variety of different um, category names, right? So it might be, you, you might have a category name called trivia or you might have a category name that is, that is something else, you know, that's not sort of one of the standard categories and, and often that's, that's trivia, uh, um, that's trivia challenges. Um, and the, the trivia challenges, they might be like basic user awareness kinds of things. So in the cloud CTF platform, we have some, we have a library of challenges of different difficulty levels. Some of them are very basic kind of trivia questions around basic user awareness. So like in the, in the conference CTF, I think I put in there, there's a, there's a um, category called malware. And those, that's, those are trivia challenges, right? It's just trivia about, it asks you, it asks you a question about different kinds of malware and you have to put in the name of that particular kind of malware. Um, introductory cybersecurity topics, you know, so, so I threw in a couple of trivia challenges like in the networking section of the conference CTF that are asking about network devices. And, um, and you know, so that's sort of basic cybersecurity knowledge, but you know, it's a thing that if the, if the student, you know, if you, have, if you have students that, and you're trying to sort of check on learning after an introductory cybersecurity block, then you can put in some of these, some of these um, trivia challenges and um, put in the definition of a thing and they have to figure out what the thing is and, and put the name of the thing in and that sort of reinforces that learning. Or if they don't know the answer, they have to do a little bit of research and, and get back and, and um, put in the, put in the uh, right thing. Um, you might see trivia challenges around like careers. So there might be questions around cybersecurity careers or, or resources related to cybersecurity careers. Um, and you'll often see trivia challenges related to non cybersecurity topics. And those are intended to just kind of keep things light and, and fun, right? So you might see sci-fi trivia in uh, a, a CTF, um, uh, you know, j just to, just so it's not all uh, bits and, and, and crypto and stuff like that. So um, you'll often see that. I try, I usually try to throw something like that into a CTF just to keep things uh, more interesting. Okay, so moving on to cryptography challenges. So here we're actually gonna look at some, some CTF challenges. So, um, so crypto. Crypto, often you're provided with an encoded message or some encoded blob. It might be a, it might be a, a file that is a, um, a binary file. 
So you're, you're provided some encoded thing and maybe some hint as to the encoding, right? And many challenges, so crypto is, is you know, crypto is a little bit of a misnomer in CTF circles because many challenges are not encryption, they're actually encodings, right? So in a crypto challenge, you might see some string of numbers in either decimal or hex. And, you know, again, this is sort of a trope for, for very entry level CTF challenges in the crypto category. You'll see like spaces uh, separating a, a list of either decimal or, or hex values. And, uh, and if, if you pull up an ASCII table, you can translate that string of numbers into letters and numbers and special symbols and et cetera. So, um, and, and so, so ASCII is not encryption, right? It's not cryptography. It's really an encoding, but, but again, many, um, particularly on the entry level challenges, lots of uh, crypto challenges are really just character encodings. So you'll see lots of ASCII encodings. You'll see, um, you'll see like things like base 64, um, you might see things like UU encoded. I mean, there, there are a variety of different encodings out there um, that are used on different computer systems. And, um, and, and some of these entry level crypto challenges are really just, really just trying to, to teach, um, you know, computer science students or computer engineering students or cybersecurity students about some of these encodings because the encodings are relevant, right? If you're, if you are doing some analysis of a piece of software as a cybersecurity person and you see, you know, you, you, you want the, you want an experienced cybersecurity person to be able to recognize these different encodings and then, and then be able to turn them back into something useful. Right. So that's the purpose of these kinds of challenges there. You know, there's, there's definitely a, a, a reason why you would want people to be able to recognize these different encodings. Um, but again, it's not, it's not cryptography. <clears throat> and then, so that's some of the, that, that's, that's some of the sort of entry level crypto challenges. And then the next level up, you might see uh, some simple monoalphabetic ciphers. So things like a Caesar cipher or a rot cipher, Caesar cipher or, or a rot rotation cipher. And so, um, you know, those are, those are often sort of synonymous. A Caesar cipher is just a, a, a cipher where you shift the alphabet. A rotation cipher is the same thing. So some traditionalists will say that a Caesar cipher shifts the alphabet by three, and, and they'll tell you that if it shifts the alphabet by something other than three, it's not a Caesar cipher. Um, so, you know, take that as you will. Um, both of these are simple shifts of the alphabet, right? And then the next level up from a, from a shift cipher, like this, is a substitution cipher. <clears throat> so a substitution cipher is different because it's not just a shift of the alphabet, but you might see um, just scrambled letters, right? So you might have, you might have, um, you know, A replace B and T replace Q, and, and it's not just sort of shifted one to the left or right. It's, um, it's uh, scrambled, you know, the, the letters are scrambled, but it's still a one for one. So a monoalphabetic cipher is still a one for one replacement. And, and a good example I use of a monoalphabetic cipher is like um, in, in a, um, in, in the newspaper, there is, um, at least in my newspaper, so I get the Roanoke Times, and on the crossword puzzle page, there's also a crypto quote, which is a monoalphabetic cipher, right? And it's not a Caesar cipher, it's not just a shift, it's a, sub, it's a, it's a substitution cipher where the, the letters are sort of scrambled. And um, the, thing about the, the thing about those crypto quotes is they generally, um, they generally provide, um, punctuation and spacing. And so if you have a, a substitution cipher where you have punctuation and spacing, then, you know, they're, they're much easier, right? Because you can, you can look at, um, you can look at the, the individual letters. And if you have a letter all by itself, that's, you know, a, a word with one letter, that's going to be either an A or an I. And usually the context is easy to identify which one of those it is. And then when you have two letter words, then there, again, there's a sort of a, a short list um, if you have a three letter word, it's almost always a the or an and. And if you see the same three letter word multiple times, then, then that is almost definitely a, a, a the or an and. Um, so, um, so, um, 
those kinds of ciphers where you have the spacing and the punctuation uh, makes them easy to solve. And then if they if they don't have that, so sometimes you'll have a you'll have a substitution cipher where things are just you know letters are all sort of squished together, um, or they're or they're provided in like groups of, of characters. And for those kinds of challenges, you can often do just a simple frequency analysis, right? So you can so, so you know frequency analysis. So we know, for example, that um, you know, in, in the English language, uh, um, like maybe E is the most is the most used letter, um, and then T, and then A, and you know, so the frequency is known, and, and so if you have a long block of text, then you can analyze the frequency of the of the characters that are used, and then you compare that to the to the you know nor, normal frequency that you would expect, and then you can identify you know, the most commonly used letters. And then from there, you can usually sort of fill in the blanks. And there are some online tools that'll do that for you. So you don't necessarily have to do it yourself um, by hand. And, and I'll show you some of those tools um, here in just a second. So the next step up from a monoalphabetic cipher is, is these polyalphabetic ciphers. So, um, so things like um, a Vignier cipher, and uh, a Playfair cipher and a Beaufort cipher and an auto key cipher. These are just examples of polyalphabetic ciphers. Um, and, and this is where you have, you don't just have a single word for word replacement, but you have, um, you know, you, you, have, you have one character could represent, you know, multiple diff different characters and vice versa. And, um, and I'll show you some resources on how to learn more about polyalphabetic ciphers. Um, the, ne the next level up from that are um, these things called transposition ciphers. So whereas these polyalphabetic and monoalphabetic ciphers use substitution, substitution, I think I spelled that right. Um, <clears throat> you're substituting one character for another. A transposition cipher does this thing called transposition. And so what, and so, what transposition means is that instead of substituting one character for another, it's it's changing the order of things, right? It's moving things around. And so an example of a transposition cipher is a rail fence. And um, a rail fence cipher um, works like this. You can you can see the the um, you know you can sort of read the flag or you can read the encrypted text in in this rail fence representation. So it says the United Kingdom, if you read it up and down, right? If you go this way and then this way and then this way, the United Kingdom. <clears throat> okay, but, but that's not how you transmit this thing. You transmit this thing row by row. So, you, so, the, so if you were to encrypt this or, or, or uh, um, you know, encipher this using this technique, you would send T N D G H U I E, and it, and so it, it's, it just essentially scrambles the letters in the phrase, and um, if you know how to solve this, like if you know it's a three rail rail fence cipher, then it's very easy to to, to turn it back into this thing, but um, if you don't know that, then then the, it's just a bunch of scrambled letters, and it's and it's hard to interpret, right? Um, all the letters are there; they're just in the wrong order. So that's a that's a rail fence cipher. <clears throat> um, again, you're just transposing the letters. Next, a, another um, another thing you might see is a columnar transposition. So a columnar transposition um, has um, you know it, it works like this. You have you have a, a a sequence across the top, and that is the key. And the sequence might be um, Numbers like this, or it might be a word, but the, the sequence is the is the order of the characters, um, uh, you know, in the alphabet. So you get some sequencing. Either way, you get some sequencing of the columns, and then you, here's our here's our uh, text that's going to be in, that's going to be encoded: a Midsummer Night's Dream. Right? If you just read it across, but um, with this columnar transposition, basically you. You shuffle the columns, so, so you reorder this thing. So you have column one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, and then that that scrambles up the, the the phrase, and then you read it across, and you get some some 
you know, output that is again scrambled letters. So that's that's transposition. And then um, the more sophisticated uh, uh, encoding techniques, they combine. They they might do like multiple columnar transpositions. So here's an example where you have some data coming in, and then you have a first secret keyword that's going to do a columnar transposition, and then you have a second secret keyword. So you do back to back, and that scrambles the content even more. And actually, um, modern uh, um, encryption techniques that are used on computer systems use this combination of substitution and transposition. So, so um, protocols like AES, the Advanced Encryption Standard, is the, the, the standard protocol for, um, for symmetric encryption uh, uh, on, on computing devices. And um, it uses this sequence of substitution and transposition to, um, to encrypt uh, data. And instead of doing that on the character by character level, like you see here, um, AES does it on the bit by bit level, right? So you're, you're, you're swapping out bits or you're moving bits around. And if you do that in a predictable way, then you can, um, then you can, turn it, you can turn it back, right? And the way to make it predictable is you have a key and the key makes, makes that whole system work. Um, okay, so, so that's, um, that's crypto challenges. Now the next level of cryptography challenges are no kidding cryptography, right? And these are um, these rely on real modern cryptographic methods. And so you so you know these kinds of challenges are challenges that like college students who have taken a crypto course are going to do well in. Um, <clears throat> so you you'll see things like. Um, you know, you'll see you'll see symmetric encryption techniques like like DES or triple DES or AES. So things like DES, for example, DES is a is sort of known to be a broken crypto system. It's it's no longer sufficiently secure, and so you might see something encrypted using using the digital encryption standard, and um, you might be able to crack that encryption. Or you might have something that is encrypted using some sort of a poor implementation of AES. Um, or you might see something that is uh, encrypted using an, an, a um, using an asymmetric encryption technique, where the where the public and private keys are computed in a way that's known to be insecure. And so you might see um, you might see some hint in the challenge description or in the challenge title that that will direct you towards some implementation flaw in a particular. Um, encryption scheme and, and you know, again, those are things that you wouldn't, you know, as, as kind of an entry level CTF player, you probably wouldn't know how to do that stuff. But if you're a college student and you've taken a math class, you know, a, a, a cryptographic, you know, math class and a, and a, um, some advanced computer science classes, then, then these would take you down a path where you could solve these kinds of um, problems. Um, you'll also see some crypto uh, challenges around hashing, right? So, it, so you'll have like passwords. You might have, you might even have a crypto challenge. Might even be a password list. In fact, there might be one of those in in the conference CTF, um, where you have to crack as many passwords as you can. Um, okay. <clears throat> so, some go-to resources for crypto challenges are listed here. First of all, if you want if you want your students to learn about these different encryption techniques, there's um, some great resources on the Khan Academy, and and hopefully people are familiar with this already. I'm not going to go to that web page because because the, the link is here and, and people have probably heard of the Khan Academy. But if you go if you Google Khan Academy um, cryptography, there's there's this great set of modules that lays out different encryption techniques, uh, and it um, and it um, has, has some videos and has some challenges along the way so you can sort of see how that stuff works. So that's pretty cool stuff. There are some websites that you can use to solve some basic uh, crypto challenges. And I give some examples here, right? So, so some of these encoding challenges, for example, you can go to this website, ascii2hex.com and, um, <clears throat> and so what, what ASCII to hex does is <clears throat> you can put in a, a bit of text and you hit convert and that bit of text is going to get translated to these different types of encodings. 
So there's base 64, hexadecimal, binary, decimal, um, ROT 13. So, so this web page is great for solving, you know, so, sort of the basic um, ASCII table kinds of CTF challenges. You put in the text and it's going to translate, or you put in the, you know, you might have, a, you might get this blob of binary data or, you, or decimal data or hexadecimal data, and you dump that blob of data into the appropriate box here and you hit convert and you might get back some ASCII text. So for an entry level CTF challenge, this might be, this, this, this is a great place to start for, um, for trying to solve those kinds of things. There's also, so if you have a, if you have a uh, Caesar cipher, rotation cipher, there's this, there's this uh, website called rot13.com. Rot13 lets you select the rotation of the alphabet and, and you put in the, you put in the quote unquote cipher text, you select the rotation and it'll give you what, what comes out on the other end. And the idea is you sort of do that until you see words that, that make sense that might be a flag. Um, there's, there's this box centric, box centric um, uh, website for, for code breaking. There, there's, um, this is a great, this is another great resource, decode.fr, www.decode.fr. This is my go-to website for any kind of, um, you know, sort of monoalphabetic or polyalphabetic cipher. And um, thank goodness it's translating into English for me. So this is, this is a, a French website, but it, it's got, um, it's got um, solvers for lots of different kinds of, again, monoalphabetic, polyalphabetic uh, encodings. Um, and so a really cool website. In fact, I'm gonna use this in a minute because I'm gonna go to, um, I'm gonna go to the CTF. So for example, um, <clears throat> for example, I can uh, click on a challenge here so here's the challenge. Oh, Caesar, my Caesar, and here's a here's a glob of text, right? And um, from the context, <clears throat> you can probably you can probably kind of sort out that this is a Caesar cipher, right? It's a simple shift cipher. But I want to turn that this glob of of letters uh, into a flag that I can put in the the flag section here. And so, um, so what I might do is I might copy that, you know, I, I don't want to do it by hand. You know, we don't, we don't do that kind of stuff by hand anymore. Um, I might, I might go here and paste it in to ASCII to hex. So there I just paste it in the blob and I'm going to click convert and I get some output. I get binary decimal base 64 hexadecimal rot 13. I got nothing. I got nothing useful here, right? So let's see, maybe I'll paste it in a different box. Paste it in there, convert. Okay, still, this doesn't look useful, right? You know, I can't, it's, a, it's letters, so I can't paste it into any of these boxes. Um, and you'll notice that the, the URL encoded or the HTML, that's, if it's a string, it's just gonna be the same thing as the string. So, so this didn't get me very far. I know it's a Caesar cipher, so I'm going to go to decode.fr and I'm going to type in Caesar. And um, uh, here's Caesar code. Caesar, I get this list of different potential uh, um, encryptions. Okay, and I'm going to, um, looks like I already did this. I'm going to, I'm going to so it, it says deciphering the Caesar code, message encrypted by Caesar code. So I'm going to type, I'm going to put in my thing, right? So I just pasted it in there. And this tool has different um, options for, for different, um, different types of ciphers, right? So this, in the Caesar cipher one, I can, if I know the offset, then um, I, can, uh, I can put in the offset here. If I, if I don't know, I can just click the button that says test all possible offsets using a brute force attack. And then I hit decipher. Um, you can also change the alphabet. This is interesting. Um, you can change the, so you can add things like accented characters, for example. And um, uh, so, yeah, so changing the alphabet is, is sometimes helpful. In fact, I had a CTF one time where um, I was doing a CTF with my, with my, 
daughter who's a, a high school kid. And she, we had a thing that was obviously a, a it was obviously a um, monoalphabetic substitution, but it, we just couldn't get quite to the to the to the answer. And she said, "I think that's French." And so she put in like some extra characters in here, and um, lo and behold, um, she's able to solve it by putting in um, like accented characters and that kind of stuff. Anyway, I'm going to hit the decipher button, and what I get over on the left hand side. Can't imagine that it's taking this long. It just wants me to show me some more ads. Um, okay, so what I get over here is I get every possible um, shift, right? So I get, and it shows me the number of the shift. But what this does is it it puts them in um, in order of what it thinks are the most likely solutions, and um, so the one you see at the top here, this comes out as the most likely solution, and that's because it was able to find English words. You know, I'm, I'm on the English version of this page. It was able to find English words in here. And so um, it uh, comes, you know, it, it does the right thing, right? It gives me the right thing. Um, so if I were to copy this, and this, this it, it actually, for, for the other, even for like the polyalphabetic ciphers, this will try to, do a brute force attack on it, and often it's very successful. It, it, you know, it implements some basic algorithms for brute force attack on, on, um, on some of those uh, ciphers. Okay, let me go back to my cloud CTF, and I put this in. So this is how the CTF works, right? I put in the flag, I hit submit, and um, I got five points. All right, so now I'm on the board. Probably not ahead, so let me go to the scoreboard and see what people are doing. All right, so nobody's paying attention to me. They're just killing the CTF. Look at that. Nice. That's awesome. Very cool. Um, I don't know what the max, I don't know what the max is on this. Christy, probably, Christy, did you solve all the challenges already? 280 may be the best you can do on this thing. Last I heard, she had two left to solve, Dave. Okay. <laughs> okay. <laughs> all right, let's see. All right, go back to my slides here. Okay, so. Um, so that is it for crypto challenges. Any questions on cryptography challenges? All right, I'm going to I'm going to go to the web. I'm going to talk about web challenges for a few minutes and then I'm going to then I'm going to leave you to your own devices for about 10 minutes to um, hack on some more challenges or go take a break um, or whatever. So um, that's mostly so I can go take a break. So the next category is web challenges. And um, so easy challenges rely on basic understanding of HTML and how websites work. And the approaches to solving are straightforward, I think, at least for the, for the early challenges. You want to do things like open the page source and or open the developer panel and look at the HTML or look at the scripts and try to decipher What's going on? Try to find a try to find a comment in an HTML page, or some sort of hidden text in an HTML page, or something in a script that that you know is, is obfuscated. Um, but you know, sort of the entry level web challenges are simply a matter of um, simply a matter of of looking at the page source, looking at the looking at the code that creates the web page, and trying to trying to identify. Um, the flag, and, and those are those are by far the most straightforward. Um, <clears throat> obviously, it gets it gets more more challenging than that. Um, <clears throat> and so, um, so if those if those you know if the if the challenge is worth more than than a few points, then these are going to be sort of taken off the table. And so, what do you do next, right? So, here are some here are some things that you can do that might get you further towards the solution. Um, of course, you should do all those things like look at the name of the challenge and Google the name of the challenge, see if it, it's pointing you in a certain direction. You should, you should you know, read the, the challenge description carefully, try to identify whether, um, you know, whether it's leading you, you in a particular direction. Um, but um, if those things are not fruitful, here's some things you can do. You can examine the network traffic, right? So, so you can, um, 
open up a tool like Wireshark and you can capture the live network traffic of you accessing a, a web page and then you can look at that network traffic and you, you you're you're the, the, there, there are things in the network traffic <clears throat> that you're not going to see <clears throat> in your browser. And the things that you're going to see in the network traffic are, you're going to see header data, for example, um, you know, uh, um, HTTP header data that is, that is never displayed anywhere on your system or in your browser, but it's, um, it is, um, it still is part of the communication between the web client and the web server. And that header data may have something useful in it that's going to point you in a particular direction. For example, it might just have the flag in a in a in a header field, right? And and um, that you'll see in in CTFs. Um, and you 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 also might see a redirect, right? So you might see that there are things that are that are downloaded or things yeah things that are downloaded from the from the server that are not that are never shown in the browser, right? And, and one thing is a, is a redirect. So when you have a page, when you, when you go to um, access a, a web page, you can do this thing on the server side that redirects you to another page. And that's done in an automated way. And that's a fairly common technique in, in, um, uh, in the web, just because you know people try to go to your index.html page and there isn't one, so the system will automatically direct you to like the login page, for example. And um, and those kind of those kinds of redirects are never displayed on your browser window. It's all it all happens in the network traffic between the client and the server. And so looking at that network client or looking at that network traffic will often is often helpful. You can also you can also curl the page. So curling the page. Curl is a command line utility in Linux that will reach out to a web uh, server and it will basically dump the response from the web server to your terminal window. And that is sort of analogous to examining the network traffic. It's not the same thing as, as examining the network traffic, but you get, a lot of this, uh, you, get, you get a lot of the same data, including the HTTP header data that you wouldn't see in your browser. So curling the web page, I think you see that. So curling the web page um, uh, can help you identify like those redirects, right? If, if there's a redirect, you'll never see the redirect in the um, in the in the browser window. But a curl dumps everything it gets back from the server. So if there's an interstitial page before you get redirected somewhere else, then you're going to see that when you curl the page. So that's a useful technique. Um, you can look for the robots.txt file. So this is a thing that um, that uh, you know server web server can <clears throat> use to um, obscure or or to, to it's, you know it doesn't necessarily necessarily hide data, but but a, a web server um, uses robots.txt to tell a, a web crawler portions of the file system that the web crawler should not um, catalog. So, so um, if you think of a search engine, for example, Google, the Google search engine, the, the way Google and all other search engines work is they have these automated bots that are going to, that are going to, um, uh, you know, follow links and try to investigate, uh, you know, all portions of a website. And then they, and then they put all that data into a database. And then when you go to google.com and you type something in, it, it's going to search, you know, Google is going to search their database, try to find things that will, um, that will, that will satisfy your search term and it'll return it to you. And what, um, what web uh, servers or what web administrators do on the server side is they can have this thing called robots.txt. And in the robots.txt, basically it's a text file in the root of your file server or in the root of your web server's file system. And it tells the web crawlers, what portions of your website that it should not catalog. And um, so the purpose of that is you might have things on your website that um, you only want people that are in the company, for example, to be able to get access to, and they have direct links to this stuff, but you don't want it to be, um, you don't want it to be cataloged because you don't want people to be able to, to search for it just on the open web. 
And so, so that's a way to, um, it's not necessarily making those things inaccessible because you can still access the things that are in those, you know, in those folders that are, that are obscured by the robots.txt. But, um, but it, it's, it's, um, it's sort of security by obscurity, right? They're not, they're never cataloged in a web, in a web search engine. And so they're less likely to be discovered by people outside of the organization. And um, so, so that is, that's a thing. And um, if people don't know that that thing exists, then there are whole portions of the internet that you'll never see because they're sort of kind of hidden behind robots.txt. And, um, but if, but if you're directed to a particular website and, um, and you're, you're sort of searching around trying to figure out what, you know, where, where there might be something hidden. If you go to the, if you go to, to the um, domain and then slash robots.txt, you might see that some portions of the, of the web server's file system are obscured from you. And then you can manually put in the, that path and get to the thing that you want to get to. So robots.txt can be fruitful. There's this thing called a directory traversal attack, which used to be fairly commonplace in the web. It's much less, um, uh, you know, you see, you see much fewer of websites that, that are, that are improperly configured these days that allow this, but they're, they're still out there, right? There are still, there are still young people who are learning how to use, you know, HTML and learning how to configure a web server and they stand up their own web server and they have this thing that's vulnerable to a directory traversal attack. And this is where you can do something like, um, you know, you might, you might have a, you might be going to a website that is like, um, uh, you know, www.example.com slash page.html, right? And HTTP. Okay, so this is a URL that's going to get you page.html from www.example.com. But if this if that web server is misconfigured, what you might be able to do is you might be able to do a directory traversal attack where you say, I want to go down a level, down a level, down a level, and then go to something like, um, something like, um, if you go down far enough, you might be able, you might be able to go to Etsy. I mean, this is just kind of a silly example, but um, you might be able to dump Etsy password, right? If you're able to, traverse down in the file system because the root of the web server is not the root of the file system. The root of the web server is some directory on the web server. And if the system is misconfigured, then th this is possible. You can, you can traverse the directory and get to parts of the file system that you're not supposed to be able to get to. And um, Yeah, Dave, you say that's a, a silly example, but that's a legitimate thing that actually happens to web servers on, on the net. Yes, right. Yeah, right. I agree. That's the point I'm trying to make is and, and the idea of, of, of exposing you to something like this is that now you know, when I, when I configure my web server, I better make damn sure that I don't allow this thing to happen, right? And that's, you know, there's a configuration setting where you can do that. Um, in fact, the default these days is configured not to do that in almost every case, but um, you know, it's, it's easy to fat finger your config and get it to do the wrong thing. Um, okay, so those are, these. This is kind of the, the the basic entry level web challenges kind of stuff. So um, so the, the you know the, the the way the web worked in the early days was like this, right? You did you had um, you, you log you you go to your browser, you type in a URL, and there's an HTTP uh, GET request that goes to a web server. And what the web server does is it looks looks out on its file system and it tries to find that file. And if the file is there, it's going to return, the, you know, the file is going to come to the server. And the file back in the old days was just HTML, right? And, and people have probably seen HTML code before. Um, you know, you have the open HTML tag, close HTML tag at the, at the end. You have open header, then you have the body and everything is, is, you know, you have this markup language where you put all the stuff and the HTML gets sent back to the browser and the browser takes that HTML file and it renders it in the browser based on tags in the, in the um, HTML file. And then there might be some images that are going to get downloaded. You know, like you have image up here at the top and you have some images at the bottom. Um, 
and it's just rendered. So this is the early web, right? And, and in the early web, the, you know, the, the, the kinds of things that could go wrong are the kinds of things I just, I just mentioned, right? You have, you have some misconfiguration of the web server, you have some stuff hidden in an HTML file, you have some, you have some header data that you might be able to discover. Um, obviously the web has evolved way past this and, and now there are, um, <clears throat> now, now the interaction between the browser and the server is much more complicated, right? So nowadays your browser might, like if I go to google.com, right? My browser might do an HTTP get to get the Google, Google uh, homepage and the file system is gonna, is gonna find that uh, HTML file, it's gonna return it and now it's rendered in my browser and then I type something in to the window here. And now when I type something into that window, now the now on the server side, the server is going to do something on my behalf based on the thing that I type into that window. And um, it's hard for me to predict as the creator of the of the web server or the creator of this website, it's hard for me to predict what a what a person might type into that text field, right? And it might be a search Field, it might be a username password field, it, you know, it, it, whatever it is, um, there's this expected thing that you're going to enter, right? So my expectation on a, on a username password page is that somebody's going to type in a well-formed username, maybe in the form of an email address, and then they're going to type in a password. And, you know, I'm going to receive that and I'm going to look up and see if the, that person should be allowed in or not. What I might not predict is I might not predict them to type in something like some kind of encoding like maybe they'll type in SQL commands. And, um, and if, I don't, if I don't think about that and think about what to do if that happens, then, um, then what might happen on the server side is my, my web server, my file system might do things on behalf of that user based on what they typed into that text field. And those should be things that they should not be allowed to do, right? So what happens when somebody types in something to, to any form field on a web page is there's this post request that goes back to the server. The server is going to is going to interpret that request and it's going to go to a database and it's going to like look up data and then it's going to return that data to the web server and then it's also going to download an HTML template and it's going to combine the database records with the HTML template and it's going to generate a web page on the fly using something like PHP or active server pages or JavaScript or whatever. And then it's going to return that generated HTML back to you. Like in this, my example here, I did a Google search and I got back, um, you know, this list of, of uh, um, websites that are, that are appropriate to my search. And that list isn't some web page that somebody typed out in HTML back at Google headquarters, right? That web page was generated dynamically based on things that I typed into my browser window. So the point I'm trying to make here is that, is that um, the, the, the web, in, in almost every website these days, the web server is going to do things on behalf of the user based on things that you type into a text box on a web page. And, um, and that opens up a whole new level of, of malicious things that can happen to a web server. So as you get to more sophisticated web challenges, this is where students can learn about things like PHP and JavaScript. They can learn about web applications and, and, and you know, how, they're, how they're improperly created so that, so that um, malicious people can do malicious things on them. And uh, you know, they, they, they should also learn a little bit about how to do it right so, so, so malicious people can't do malicious things to their website. So advanced web challenges generally have some, some understanding of uh, different kinds of injection attacks like SQL injection or command injection. They might be vulnerable to things like cross-site scripting. Um, uh, you know, and some, some of the things that you can look for are, you know, you can look for PHP applications that, are, that have bugs in them that don't, that don't properly sanitize input and allow you to type in SQL and get some result that you shouldn't be able to get. There might be some sort of sensitive data exposure, right? So you might have files on the server that are not, that, for which the permissions are not set properly. And as an attacker, I might be able to browse to portions of the web server and, and be able to observe that stuff. 
um, version control artifacts. If the, if the web server is using like Git or, or something else, they might, you know, that stuff might be left in a place where you can see it and that might uh, help you um, uh, hack into that website. There might be some broken authentication system. Um, you know, anybody who rolls their own username, password, login kind of a system, they're just asking for trouble. You know, they should use a standard library for that kind of stuff, but, but sometimes people roll their own. Um, <clears throat> sometimes you see a web server that has like some default installation and it'll even have like the default username and password for the administrator login. That's a thing that you see sometimes. Um, or you might have inclusion vulnerabilities where you can like, where, where it's possible to, to include a file that has some, you know, like upload a file that has some malicious thing in it that, that causes the, the web server to, to go haywire. So those are, these are different ways that people can attack web applications. And um, they're also ways that people hide flags in CTF challenges. Um, yeah, so um, I talked about some of this already, right? Use the web browser, use the developer tools to examine scripts, use Wireshark to examine the packets. Um, you can use ngrep to search for strings and packet captures. Or so sometimes, you know, you can, you can, you can do a live uh, um, capture of downloading the, the PCAP and then you save that as a PCAP and then you can use tools like ngrep to examine the, the packets. Um, and you can use a web proxy. So here's the, here, this is a tool called OWASP ZAP, which stands for, that's an acronym, it's um, attack proxy, something, Z attack proxy or something like that. Um, with a proxy like this, and, and these are, these are on, um, you'll see these on, um, on Kali Linux, o OWASP ZAP is part of Kali Linux. Um, you can you can configure your you, you can start up a browser like this, like OWASP or Burp Suite, uh, and you can point your browser to to interact with the with the um, proxy instead of directly with the with the internet. And you can examine the traffic in the in the proxy, and you can even modify the traffic. Like if there's a if there's a cookie that's added. In, in the traffic to and from the server, you can modify that cookie and, and see if you can cause the, the server to do something, uh, something weird. Uh, so those are some interesting tools and techniques. Okay, so I'm gonna stop here and, and we're gonna take um, about a 10 minute breather. Um, so I'm gonna come back at, uh, let's see, 10.37. I'm gonna come back at 10.50, 10.38 I have. 10.50, we're, I'm gonna start up again at 10.50. What you should do is uh, take a break. And um, if you haven't been solving CTF challenges, then um, you should take a look at, there's some crypto challenges and there's some web challenges here. Um, these two web challenges should be straightforward based on what we've talked about already. This one, um, I've talked about how to solve this, but this one is, is a, um, something that you should look at too. Okay, so any questions before we take a quick break until 10.50? All right, great. Let's take a break and I'll be back online here in a little over 10 minutes.
Hey Dave, we did have a, a request if you're willing to uh, do a quick demo. Yeah. Uh, can you show how to edit a challenge uh, and, and how to add a hint to a challenge? Yeah, I'm going to show, I plan to show all that like towards the end. Okay, um, that sounds great. I'm going to, yeah, I plan to do all that. Start my again. Another question. Uh, do you have the, the slides available by a link right now, or are you going to make those available afterwards? The slides are, so I uploaded the slides to Whova. Um, I uploaded the slides to Whova. And okay. do they I'll show up it. in the session, or do they show up somewhere else? No. Hey, Dave, they are not showing up. Like, if you are in the Whova app, Usually you can see the slides underneath where it says speaker, but we don't see yours. Um, really? I, I don't, I don't know. Do you, does anybody you, else see them? Are you on the, um, are you on the web, web client or the uh, mobile client? I'm on the web client. So for the, like the other session I was in, you could see the presentation right under where the speaker was. I just didn't see it here. Um. I am in the mobile app um, and I don't see them either. That's frustrating. <clears throat> Okay. Dave, do you have a link um, for them that you could put in the chat? I don't. Uh, I no. I I uh, okay. trying to find them on Whova here. I uploaded them to Whova last night, and um, well, I'm sure we can make it available. Um, at least at the end of this. Oh yeah, we can definitely make it available afterwards. I was, I was hoping to be able to point people to it. Um, and then Dave, you're going to walk through those three um, web challenges, right? Sure. Yeah, I can do that. Okay. <clears throat> um, okay. So I'm in. I'm jumping into Cyber Range, and uh, <clears throat> okay. So. Um, so, so I'll take a look at these challenges uh, really quick. So, so these are, these are the web challenges. And so, Agent Triple Zero says Secret Squirrel has a secret message on his homepage at www.secretsquirrel.com. Can you find it? Free hint: It's not a comment. Okay, so I'm going to go to www. Secret squirrel.com. Free, it's okay, it's a hint that is on <clears throat> secret message on the home page, not in a comment. So, um, a couple ways to solve this one. One easy way is to pull up the um, developer tab. I don't know why it's showing at the bottom. There we go. Um, so, so if you look through this, um, so here's the HTML. And when I move to different parts of it, it sort of highlights over here where I am, right. And there is a couple, there are a couple of hints in this, in this page, and it's highlighting the hints, right. So here's a hint up at the top. And then it said, and then down here, there's a thing that says secret message after the slash body tag, and then it says squidly diddly. So there's a, here's, this is a fairly obvious flag, right? Um, but that, that, this is not the flag for this challenge. And um, it's, this is a hint, or, I mean, this is a, this is a, a comment, right? So here's a, here's a, 
of left bracket, exclamation point, dash, dash, and anything between those two things in HTML is a comment. So, um, so you have to sort of, you have to sort of know what a comment is in HTML to know that this is not the answer. So then, um, so now I don't, I don't see it, right? So, but I can, if I, if I expand this thing out a little bit, I can see more of the HTML content. And um, I'm just expanding out the different sections of this thing. And by doing that, I, I see more of the, of, the, of the content of the page. And here's this paragraph <clears throat> that says, could this be the secret message, question mark. And so the, the challenge says, Secret Squirrel has a secret message on his homepage. Can you find it? And here I found this thing in here that says, could this be the secret message? And I don't see this anywhere on the page, but it's obviously in the HTML. <clears throat> and so why is it, why can't I see it? Well, I can't see it because it's, um, white text on a white background. And so, so to see it, I don't even really have to do the developer tab thing. If I just highlight stuff on here, then it shows up. So that's the secret message. And if you copy that little message and paste it, um, that's, that's, the, that's the answer to that one. Uh, ro Robots.txt. <clears throat> this one says, what is secret trying to hide? HTTP www.secretscroll.com and um, then a link to the page, right? So, so um, this is one where if you don't know what robots.txt is, now I, I talked about that earlier, but um, if you don't know what this is, then you can do some Googling to learn about robots.txt and how it works. And if I go to the web page and put in, again, robots.txt is a text file that is stored in the root of the web server's um, file system. Not the, not the file system of the server itself, but the web root. So this root of the web pages and stuff. And I, I go to secretsquirrel.com slash robots.txt. And this is the format of this thing. It, it's got you know, this, this user agent line and then it says disallow. And then it's got, in this case, it's only got a single uh, subdirectory that's disallowing slash secrets slash. And so what, what, what the disallow um, directive tells a web uh, crawler is that you should not follow that path. Don't, don't um, map the pages that are in that portion of the, of the web server's file system. So now I know what, now I know the location of the stuff that Secret Squirrel is trying to hide. So what I'm gonna do here is I'm gonna say, okay, let's look in there and see what's there. Secrets. And, um, and when I do that, the flag just jumps right out, right? There's the flag. But where are the robots? And I copy that, paste, submit. That should give me my points. Not correct, how's that not correct? Oh, because I have a space at the end. There was a space that came along when I copied uh, it got a space along with it. So I need to have a better regular expression on that uh, channel, but there, there I got my points. Okay, this Bravo one, this one's a little bit more challenging. Um, <clears throat> Bravo.VirginiaCyberRange.net. So I go here, it says to view the rest of the site, log in here and it's asking for a username and password. And um, uh, yeah, that's not going to get me anywhere. I'll just tell you, that's not going to get me anywhere. I can look at the developer tab. And this says, this will keep hackers out that can't even view our index without being redirected. Okay, so you see I ended up at login.php and I was redirected there. That's, a, that's one of these redirects. And so, I, and, and so my, my um, browser tried to grab the default um, page, which is like index.html or index.php or whatever, and it gets redirected somewhere else, and that never shows up in my browser. So the way to see something like that is I can, um, I can use Wireshark to, to look at the network traffic, and I can, I can see it that way. I can um, use a proxy. So if I use, a, if I use like that Z attack proxy or if I use Burp Suite, I can see that 
you know, I can see that interaction, that redirect. Um, if I log into my, um, if I go to my cyber range system, I should be able to, um, I'm going to pull up a browser window here. <clears throat> I should be able to curl it, curl, is curl installed here? Okay, so if I go to curl, um, It should be bravo.virginiacyberrange.net. I'm going to curl HTTP bravo.virginiacyberrange.net. Okay, <clears throat> when I curl that, whoa, I curled it. And um, <clears throat> here there's this thing in here. It says go to this. So, so what I'm seeing here is, is the, the, before the redirect, there's a page that, that is displayed, but it's never, it never shows up in my, in my browser, right? So this is an insecure redirect and it has this, if you look in here, it has this message in it. And again, if I were, to, if I were to do this in Wireshark, I mean, I probably, I, I just know that curl will give me this, but probably what I would have done with something that I thought was a redirect was I would have observed the traffic in Wireshark. And you'd, you'd be able to, you know, get to the same thing. But I, I do that and then, um, and then I copy it, copy the selection. And um, let's see if I can paste this into my, look at that. Oh, no, that's not where I wanted to paste it. So um, I'm going to paste it in right here. something work. I should be able to paste it in right there. The PHP, right? So range. Maybe I need to curl it again. I guess I'm I guess I'm getting redirected again maybe huh? Yeah, there we go. There's the flag. So I just curled it again and got the thing. Again, if I was watching the network traffic when I went when I tried to go to this in the web browser, I, I would I would I would see this in Wireshark because this is all network traffic that's going back and forth between the, the client and the server. Um, it, let me point out here that I'm I'm cutting and pasting. This is a thing that you couldn't do um, a month ago in the cyber range, but. I'm cutting and pasting between my Virginia Cyber Range virtual machine here in my browser tab. So I just hit Control. Whoops! I just I'll I'll do a copy selection, and now I'm um, going back to my um, browser that's in uh, running in Firefox on my Windows 10 machine, and I'm pasting in that thing. So cutting and pasting between Cyber Range systems and um, and your your desktop. Uh, whatever it is, is now um, much more straightforward than it was before because we have updated our cyber range environments so you can do this kind of thing. Okay, so that's the web challenges. Any questions on, on that stuff, web stuff? All right. Um, <clears throat> let me go back to my slides. I'm going to go back to the slides. All right, next I want to talk about networking challenges. <clears throat> and um, again, networking challenges have a couple of different flavors. Um, you can, um, most of them, most of the ones that you'll see, particularly particularly in, in you know, your, your remote capture the flag system, uh, um, competitions, like where you're logging in from somewhere else, like this one. In most cases, you're examining, um, a, a packet capture file. So it's a file that has been, um, that is network traffic that's been captured on a system. You know, so, so um, the, the way to capture network traffic is you can, for example, like open up Wireshark and then you can browse to web pages. Um, 
and then you can and then you can stop the Wireshark capture, and then you can save that as a PCAP. <clears throat> so if 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 any of you are interested in creating web challenges, that's how you that's how you capture the the traffic is you, you use a tool like Wireshark um, or TCP dump if you're on a Linux system. Um, <clears throat> So that's one flavor, packet capture files. Some of them have live network traffic. So we do some live in-person CTFs. This, this, we, the Cyber Range, does some live in-person CTFs. And when we do those, we, um, we sometimes have challenges that have, like, no kidding, live network traffic. So we had some last year that were, not last year, the year before. Um, I guess it would, would have been 2019. We had some wireless uh, network traffic going on and, and some CTF challenges around that, which was pretty cool. But we had all the students in the same room, and they could all observe the wireless traffic. So that kind of a thing is more difficult if you have if you have remote uh, participants. The tool, the the, the primary go-to tool that you're going to use um, for most of these kinds of challenges is Wireshark, right? So Wireshark is a protocol analyzer, great graphical tool for analyzing network traffic. I'm going to pull it up in here in a minute. We're going to be able to look at it. It's available for Windows, Linux, and Mac. So you don't have to. Um, you know, you don't necessarily have to have a Linux system to use Wireshark. You can install Wireshark on your um, on your Windows 10 machine or your Mac or whatever. The place to get Wireshark is at www.wireshark.org. Now, if you just Google Wireshark download, then you can download it in other places besides from the Wireshark.org webpage because it's open source software. Um, uh, but um, if you download it from somewhere else, you're likely to get some adware along with it. You know, lots of those software download sites are, are notorious for um, tacking extra stuff on. So you'll get Wireshark, but you'll get some sort of adware that, that causes ads to pop up on your system or whatever. I, I suggest, I highly recommend if you're going to download this or have your students download it, go to the source, go to Wireshark.org, download it from there, and you'll get the, the clean version. Um, so Wireshark is a great tool. Um, but the one thing about Wireshark, though, is it's a it's a GUI tool, right? Graphical user interface, and so it's um, it's uh, not um, it's not super efficient. If you have a, if you have a huge packet capture, for example, a very large PCAP file, then Wireshark gets kind of bogged down in trying to render or trying to search, you know, to, trying to support the GUI along with trying to do something with the packet capture as you try to search for specific protocols, for example. And so, um, so the, the ways the the ways that you can examine network traffic without all the Wireshark GUI stuff is using tools like TCP dump or Wind dump. These are um, command line tools for examining network packet traffic, and um, they are things that take some. You know, there's a there's a learning curve involved with the command line tools, but um, if you suffer the learning curve. They're, they're very efficient for examining um, you know, large network packet traffic. You can, you can easily filter out um, you know, the, 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 the packets that you want to see. And um, in fact, you can use those tools to, to grab the packets you want to see, excuse me, and then, and, and then you know, restrict the size of the packet capture, then pull that modified packet capture into Wireshark if you, if you know what you're doing with things like TCP dump. So, Pretty good tools. And then NGRAP. NGRAP uh, stands for Network GRAP. And um, so NGRAP is, is like GRAP. So if you're familiar with the Linux GREP utility, GREP is used to find strings or sequences of, of ASCII characters in um, a file. And NGRAP is designed specifically to do the same thing for network packet uh, capture files. So it works very similarly to the regular grep command, but you can use ngrep, put in a pattern, and then put in the name of a packet capture file, and it'll um, it'll uh, search the string that you're looking for. So those are good tools for networking challenges. Um, I'm going to jump into Wireshark here and, and just show uh, how to do how, how to analyze a basic packet capture. Um, so um, Wireshark uses these things called display filters, and um, and the, the, the display filters are used to um, drill down on the, on the packets that I really want to see. So in, in most network packet captures, um, there's, there's you know, a fair amount of just housekeeping traffic between clients and servers, or there's, there's traffic going on in the network that 
that doesn't have anything to do with what you're trying to do and um, or the CTF challenge that you're trying to solve. <clears throat> and so um, being able to filter out the specific traffic that you want to look for is, is a very important task. And this is, you know, this gets to those basic cybersecurity analyst sorts of tasks, right? So if you're, if you're, you know, like, like at Virginia Tech, we capture, um, we can't, we don't capture all network traffic because there's way too much of it, but we capture in, in some portions of the network, we capture um, some of the traffic and we hold on to it for some fixed time period, a couple of days. And we do that in portions of the network where there's, there's um, like, um, you know, financial data being transacted or there's like PII and that kind of stuff because we want to make sure that if, if any of those systems are compromised, we want to be able to look at the packets that, that transition the network to try to identify who the attacker was and what they did and et cetera. And, um, and so if you're going to examine that kind of packet data, you have, to, you have to be able to filter out the noise, right? There's a whole bunch of noise in the traffic and you have to be able to drill down on specific things like the IP addresses or protocols or, or whatever. And in Wireshark, you use display filters to do that. And so here's an example display filter and there's this, there's this display filter bar in Wireshark. And here I, I, my filter says IP.DST. So that's the destination IP address. So I wanna filter, I wanna, I wanna find packets that have a destination IP address of 10.3.0.20 and also have TCP port of 80. And so um, here's my result, right? Here's the destination IP address. So I'm only seeing packets that have a destination IP, IP of 10.3.0.20. And I'm only seeing packets that have a, 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 a TCP port of 80, right? So, so, um, the port information, uh, you know, th th this, if I, drew, if I showed the actual network packets, you'd see that each one of these is, um, is to or from TCP port 80. And um, I'm just not showing that much of the output here, but, but that's what it does. Um, and so, and, and I, I use the text box here and I, I use an expression uh, there, there's, if I click the expression button over here on the right, this helps me construct my, my um, display filter. So I don't have necessarily have to memorize all these different filters. There's the, 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 the uh, display filter system in Wireshark helps me do that a little bit. And I'll show you that here in a second. Um, so then I, I type in my filter, then I click apply and the stuff that I don't want to see is filtered out. And then when I'm done looking at that specific traffic, then I can hit clear and, the, and the, it's gonna clear the filter and then I'm gonna see all the traffic again. And so um, let, let me, I'm gonna, I'm gonna pull up one of these challenges, <clears throat> one of these networking challenges and I'll show you what this looks like in, in Wireshark, play around with it a little bit. So here's a challenge called MacWho and it says, um, what is the MAC address of the system at 192.168.9.128 in the attached packet capture file? Okay, so, so for this challenge, um, you know, if I don't know what a MAC address is, then I, then I might do some Googling to learn what a MAC address is. Um, if I don't know what an IP address is, you know, I might do some Googling to figure out what that is. Uh, but uh, eventually I'm gonna get to the point where I have to examine this traffic. So I'm gonna click on the packet capture and um, Fortunately, I have Wireshark installed on this system. Um, I could do this in my in my uh, Kali Linux system too, but I'm I have Wireshark here, so I'm going to just do it right here. Okay, so here, um, oh, I will remind me later. Okay, so here I'm in Wireshark. Hey, if, if someone doesn't have Wireshark on their laptop they're gonna to have to actually do the capture flag through the cyber range in order to download the file and look at it? Uh, yeah, well, yeah, yeah, you can, okay. yes, you can do that. So, so um, I could do that too, right? So here I am in, in uh, the cyber range and um, yeah, so I can, I can pull this up over here too. Let's see, let me, let me pull up the CTF over here. And I'll do it in, um, so if I go to macro.io slash workshop. Um, let me log in here real quick. Sign in. There I am. Okay. 
yeah, so I can, I can get to the CTF here in Kali Linux. And um, if I go to networking, Aku, uh, click there. It's going to download the save file. So I could open with, um, I'm just going to save it, webcapture.pcap. So now if I go over to, so I could open Wireshark from, I mean, I could browse to where that is in the, in the, in the file system, or I could open Wireshark and go to the file. I know that the file is in the downloads folder in my home directory, so I can go to downloads and there's webcapture.pcap. Um, can you see that? So now I'm just going to say Wireshark web webcapture.pcap. And that should open Wireshark. And there it is. <clears throat> okay, so um, it says 192.168.9.128. Yeah, let's say to 9.128. Okay, so I'm going to go into my, I'm, I'm up here in the filter bar and I'm going to click, I'm going to say IP. So you notice when I type this in, when I start typing in a filter, Wireshark is going to help me by providing all the different things that I could continue this with. So I can start typing over here and this is going to help me remember what the, what the different filters are. There's also, um, oh, I guess this doesn't have the filter, the expression filter in it. Hmm, interesting. Um, it's probably there somewhere. I just don't get the same menu as I do on a Windows system. Um, anyway, so I'm going to type in ip.addr, ip.address equals, and then it's that thing, 192.168.9.128. So if I do that, now, now the traffic is... I, I, I'm looking at all of the traffic that's either to or from this IP address. So I have source or destination is 192.168.9.128. I could also change the filter a little bit and I could say IP.source if I just want to see traffic from that IP address. And so there's this, now the only packets I see are from 192.168.9.128. And um, there's a bunch of traffic here and I could, I could, do some examination of this traffic actually. I could right click and I could do things like follow TCP stream and I could see a bunch of stuff here, right? This looks like some sort of an encrypted tunnel um, SSH session or something. Um, that's, that's not, I mean, that's interesting, but that's not going to help me solve my challenge because really all I have to do is, um, okay, let me clear that filter, go back to the filter I had before. That's not going to help me solve my challenge because the challenge is to find the, the MAC address of the system at that IP address. So if I click on any one of these packets, I can, I can, um, the, the, the protocol hierarchy is, is, um, listed down here at the, in the middle, in the middle box here. And I get, um, it goes from the, the it goes from the, um, physical layer up to the, to the um, um, MAC layer, medium access control layer, up to the network layer or the IP layer, up to the um, transport layer, and then finally, um, well, this is so at, at the application layer. This is using TLS. If I, if I if this was like if this was like an HTML interaction, I would see the HTML traffic here at the application layer. But what I'm interested in is uh, I, here's the IP, the IP uh, protocol data in this packet, and the source address is 192.168.9.128. Okay, so I'm looking for the, the, um, the Ethernet address or the MAC address of the system with that IP address. And so here's the source IP address, 192.168.9.128, and here is the, um, here's the Ethernet address. So 000C29B4F1C2. And if I put that in, um, how do I copy? Uh, copy the value. Well, that can be what I want. I, I need to copy that. Let's see if I can paste it in here. Yeah, it gave me way more than I wanted. Um, I guess I can get rid of all this other stuff. Delete. Hopefully the format's right. This is one of these things. Okay, I, I, that was correct. This is one of these things where 
um, you know, it, it's um, if, if, the, if the creator of the CTF challenge doesn't put in the same format that I just put in, if they used capital letters, for example, in the hex instead of lowercase, then, uh, then I may have put that in and it may have told me that my answer was incorrect. And so I'm going to show you in, in just a few minutes, I'm going to, I'm going to dig into the CTF system a little bit and I'll, and I'll, I'm going to show you how you put in challenges and there's, there's some amount of um, being able to ignore case and, and, you know, do some pattern matching in the, uh, in the, um, in the uh, 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 flag um, stuff. Um, okay, so that's the basic. Here's how you know that's how you use Wireshark to to do stuff to analyze network traffic, and um, you know so these these other um, challenges you can you can sort of mosey your way through these. Um, so I'm going to go back to my let's see go back to my slides here. Um, and, uh, David, David. Yes. I just wanted to point out that you were talking about the uh, the, the Wireshark, the expression icon you didn't see. Yeah. So as Wireshark comes with different updates, they make modifications. So that's one thing we need to be aware of also. Yeah, okay. So do you think the expression builder might not be there anymore? Or that maybe it's in uh, different ways? Uh, yes. Yeah. Yeah, I wonder if it's a toolbar I don't see or, yeah, I, I don't know, maybe it's not there anymore. There used to be this this expression builder and it was just a sort of a gooey way to put together um, uh, the, the um, display filters, but I don't know, maybe that's not there anymore. Maybe I'm not finding it in the right place. Um, yeah, thanks for that, that's a good point. So, um, so your expressions can get very complicated, right? You can use Boolean expressions. So, you know, I can look at, uh, um, very specific, so this is traffic from a particular IP address. I can look at ports. I can use Boolean expressions, so I can say, I only want to see traffic that is from this source IP address and to this destination IP address. I could even tack on, um, um, you know, ports and protocols to the end here. So this and this and this, and I can use, uh, you know, parentheses to break this up. Um, so so the, the expressions can, can be very, very specific. Um, okay. Yeah, and then the kinds of the, the kinds of protocols that you'll see in, in most of the CTF challenges are, you know, particularly in the in the beginner to intermediate challenges, you're going to be looking for like HTTP traffic, FTP or TFTP. So FTP and um, you know this is ports 20 and 21. The HTTP is going to be TCP port 80. Um, file trans, yeah, so to, FTP is file transfer without, without encryption. Um, Telnet, um, you might see like email traffic, SMTP, so things like port 25, oops, port 25, uh, POP, port 110, IMAP, port 143. The, these are email communication port protocols. You might see some of this in, in, in uh, uh, web traffic. So, some things, um, that you can sort of ignore, particularly in, in uh, entry level web challenges are secure protocols, things like HTTPS or SSH or SFTP um, or SMTP if it's on some of these other protocols because this is secure, these are, these are encrypted tunnels for secure uh, traffic. And in an entry level CTF challenge, they're not gonna expect you to be able to break the encryption to be able to analyze what's going on in that, in that communication. So if, if, if there's a challenge that requires you to examine traffic using one of those protocols, usually there's more to it than that. And there's some way that you're able to, you know, there might be some, uh, um, uh, you know, private key that you have to find somewhere before you can go on to analyze the web traffic, right? You have to be able to break the encryption somehow. And, um, and you're gonna, you, you know, you, you, you're, you're likely to see that in some very advanced web challenges, but you're not gonna see it in sort of entry level to intermediate web challenges. Um, so, uh, what time is it here? So there's a, there's a set of slides that walks through how to do um, file carving. And in, in network traffic, it's, um, it's often useful to be able to pull files out of the web traffic, right? So you might have 
you might have a, um, a web interaction between a client and the server, and you might have a, 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 an image file or a document file or something that is, that is transmitted between the client and the server. It could be a web transaction. It could be a, an FTP, you know, requesting a file from an FTP server. It could be any number of different sorts of client server applications, but there are often files that are, that are traded between clients and servers and that those files exist in the network traffic between the client and the server, right? And so um, there are lots of CTF challenges, particularly as you get up into the sort of the intermediate ones where you have to be able to carve the file out of the uh, web traffic. And this is true in, in CTFs and in incident response, right? You can imagine that, that um, if you have some uh, potential intrusion of your network and you want to identify what uh, what data might have gotten pulled off of your systems, you want to be able to dig into the network traffic and, and find those files. And so file carving is a, is a technique that is uh, pretty important for a, for a, a cybersecurity analyst. And um, you'll, see, you'll see challenges in CTFs often that require you, know, you to do some file carving. So, um, so you know, how do you do that? Um, I'm, gonna, I'm gonna talk about this a little bit and uh, you know, we're getting to the point where I'm not sure I'm going to have time to, to do this in person, but I'm going to um, I'm going to provide these slides to you. I'm sorry the slides aren't there. I, I, I swear to God, I uploaded them last night and um, I, I guess I should have went back and checked to make sure they got to the right place because because um, they don't seem to be there. But <clears throat> but um, the, the slides walk through this process of carving a file and um, so I will talk a little bit about this to put it in context. Um, in, in many cases, the, the file type may be identified in the network traffic header information. Okay, so, so like the, the request, like if a, if, a, if a web page has images embedded in it, then there's gonna be a request from the client to the server for an image file, and it's gonna have a file extension. So JPEG or a, or a um, GIF or whatever, and um, or if it's a FTP download, it might have a .dot text extension or .dot doc extension or some some file extension that indicates what the file type is. And different files, different file types have different signatures, and the signature is part of the binary stream. You know, so so the signature is in the binary file itself. And it indicates the the, um, the beginning of the file and the end of the file, and the reason that um, the reason that data is there is it, is, it, is it makes it so that systems can identify, you know, what's a doc what's a dot doc file, what's an XLS file, what's an image file, what's a what's a whatever, and um, and so you can identify what a file is, or you can identify the start and end of a file based on that on that, um, that signature. So here's some examples. A Word document, the header of a standard Word document file is gonna have this signature, D0CF11E0, and this is in hex, so it's, so it's one through 10 and, and uh, A through F, zero, zero through nine and A through F. D0CF11E0, A1, et cetera. And, um, and then it, a Word document has a footer, looks like this. So you can identify the start and end of a Word document based on the header and the footer. And you can carve that out of the binary transfer between the client and the server. And, and when you do that, you, you can use a, a hex header to do that after you download the binary data between the two, and then you can pull that file out. A PDF has this header and this footer. So you can identify the start and end of a PDF file. A zip file looks like this. A JPEG looks like this. It always starts with this FFD8. Here's the whole header, but but um, you know you, it always starts with this FFD8, FFE0, and it all, and it ends with FFD9. So you can identify a JPEG file in a in a stream of binary data. And so um, so. <clears throat> These slides walk you through how to do this file carving exercise. So basically, um, if you download file packets.pcap and then you find the HTTP traffic between the, the 
um, this um, source and destination. You can follow the TCP stream, and then you can download, <clears throat> excuse me, you can download that data as the binary stream, and then you save it to your local system, and then you can open it in a hex editor. And in the hex editor, you find, so this, this picture over here on the right shows me, I, I'm, I'm finding this header from the JPEG. So there's the FFD8, um, or it's actually right here, FFD8, FFE0. I highlighted the wrong piece there. And so what I would do in, in my hex editor is I would delete all this. And so there's my header for my, for my JPEG. And then at the very end, there's the, there's an, you know, you don't see this whole thing, but, but in this um, hex editor tool, you can do a search and you can find the FFD9 that indicates the footer. And so you delete everything after that and then you save it with a .jpg extension and then you just open that up as a JPEG. And so I'm gonna, right, right after we're done here, I'm gonna, I'm gonna post these file, this file again. And so you can, you can take some time if you want to this afternoon and walk through this. But this is, this is a manual file carving exercise that shows you how to carve a file out of a, uh, out of a network packet capture. Now, um, I'll, I'll also say this, there, there's Wireshark provides an automated file carving tool, right? So you, so you can imagine, you know, I can do this manually. So why don't, why doesn't, why don't they just, why doesn't Wireshark just implement this system so that it, it'll do that automatically? And they do, right? So Wireshark does have an automated file carving tool and I will say that it, 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 it works about half the time. So it's definitely not 100% effective. I would say that it's, it's maybe 50% effective, but it's, not, it's absolutely not perfect. So, um, so, it's, it's, so if, if, you wanna, um, if you want to not learn the manual way and just sort of rely on the, on the automated way, then, uh, then just understand that it's not always gonna work for you. But to do it the, in, the, um, in the automated way, I give directions in these slides too. So you basically follow the TCP stream and you, um, and you um, do this file export objects. And in this case, I was looking at HTTP traffic. So I specify the protocol of the transfer and then, um, and then it'll, it'll try to find every file and then dump it. Um, and then I can search through those files and I can download them and I can examine them. And um, so that, that's, that's a thing, uh, the automated way, again, the automated way is not, is not uh, super effective, but it works uh, sometimes. I don't wanna walk all through, through all that because I wanna spend some time here at the end showing you the back end of the cloud CTF system um, so that, so that for, for the folks who are gonna use it in class, they'll know how to, they'll know how to make it work. Okay, last thing I'm going to talk about very briefly is reverse engineering challenges. And um, reverse engineering usually has you start with an executable program, usually. So you have some program and you need to, you need to um, find the flag in this, this executable program. And, and there, there are different ways to do that. You can... Um, you can maybe get the program to, if you use some, some specific tools, you can maybe get the program to, to follow a specific execution path for which it would not otherwise follow to get you to the result, right? And so, um, so like if a, if a program asks you for a password, so you might have a program where you, where you run the program at the command line, it asks you for a password, you put in a password and it says that password is wrong and um, <clears throat> so if you just run the file, you know, guessing the password may never get you to where you want, but you might be able to get the program to bypass that password request, for example, if you know how to, how to analyze the program in, uh, you know, some of these tools for, for reverse engineering. And, um, and then you can get the program to, to do what you want it to do. You also might be able to, <clears throat> You also might be able to just examine the, the program in one of these tools and identify the flag somewhere in the, in the data that's associated with the program itself. 
um, or you might be able to run strings on it. Some, to, some common tools that you might use during reverse engineering are listed here. So there's this one called OBJ dump, obj dump. This is, a command, this is a Linux command line disassembler that will disassemble the program and show it at the command line. And there are some very specific reasons why you might use this kind of thing. There's a program called GDB, a graphical, or I'm sorry, uh, GNU debugger. This is a Linux command line debugger. It's a tool that, um, that um, you know, if, if, you're, if you're taking a programming class, you know, so like computer science students who are learning to program, they would, they would you know, if they're using a Linux system especially, they'd probably use GDB to debug their software. Um, that's a tool that you can use on an executable program and cause it to do things that it wouldn't otherwise do. Um, there's a tool called Binwalk, examines binary images for embedded files. So Binwalk actually can be really effective if you think there might be some data hidden inside of another file, for example. Binwalk will try to extract various binary data from, from different files. Um, Ida Pro is, um, is a commercial disassembler and decompiler. That's what this image is over here. Um, for, for students who are college students who are, who are just getting started with reverse engineering challenges, they're going to use Ida Pro. Um, there's a free version that, that works pretty well. The paid version costs a lot of money, like in the tens of thousands of dollars, not in the tens of thousands, in the, it costs in the thousands of dollars. So, so the basic paid Ida version is a couple of thousand dollars, but they provide, they provide um, uh, free demo versions that, that do most of the basic stuff that you'd want to do for a CTF challenge. Um, and uh, so Ida Pro is a, is a good tool. There's also a new tool, when I say new, I guess it's maybe two years, called Ghidra. And this is a uh, open source um, disassembler and decompiler that was created by the NSA. It's written completely in Java. It's completely extensible. It runs on any platform that'll run Java. It's a very interesting tool. Um, and uh, this, this is what lots of CTF teams are shifting to away from Ida Pro, shifting to Ghidra because it's, because it's free and open source and um, you, can, you can write extensions for it and people write, do write extensions for it. Um, so that, that's something interesting that if you, again, if you have a capture the flag team, you might point them towards that sort of a tool. Um, so I'm just gonna talk about entry level challenges. What do you do to an entry level CTF challenge that's in a reverse engineering category. I'm not going to go into the weeds here, but I'll show you what I do with any basic, you know, reverse engineering challenge when I, when I try to examine it. First thing I, you got to do is download the file and then run strings on it. Sometimes the flag is obvious, if, especially if it's like a five point reverse engineering challenge. Um, if it's a, if it's an executable program, usually it's going to be an executable program. Um, I I, uh, I figure out what kind of a what kind of a file it is, and I and I use the file command to do that. File, so I'm at the command prompt. File, and then the name. And if it's a if it's an elf, then it's a Linux executable. If it's a PE, then it's a Windows executable. So you can so you can go to your Windows system, pull down the PE, and then run it and see what it does. Could be an ARM image. It could be an ARM uh, uh, program. So an embedded. This is these ARM is used in embedded systems. Um, yeah, so you run file and then the file name. If it's an, if I'm on a Linux system and I want to, and it's an elf file, so executable, then I want to make it runnable so I can run it. So normally when I pull it, pull it down off the system, off the CTF system, it's not going to be runnable. So I have to run Chmod, uh, uh, and, and I give it a plus X to make it executable and then the file name, and then I'll run it and see what it does. And so, um, let me just quickly, I'm, I'm back on my Kali Linux system. And I'm going to go to reverse engineering. And um, so here are some reverse engineering challenges. One is called strings. And if I download this, I'm going to save it. And I'm going to close Wireshark so I don't need it anymore. And OK, so here, <coughs> so here now I have this thing called strings. And so now I can follow that list of steps, right? I can say file strings and it's an elf 32 bit executable. So this is a program that I can run on a Linux system. I can run strings against it, strings, strings. Um, and if I look in the strings, 
Um, okay, there's the flag right, right there. Okay, so strings, this is a five point reverse engineering challenge. So I, I should have known that it was gonna be very easy. Um, but let's say, this, let's say strings wasn't useful and I saw that it was an elf. Now I might wanna run the program. So I can run it by saying dot slash strings and it says, oh, permission denied, that's odd. So let me do an LSAL. And so we see here, here's the strings and it's readable by the student account, but it's not executable. So I need to make it executable in order to run it. So I have to say chmod plus x strings, oops, spelled it wrong. Okay, now I can say strings and, you know, it doesn't really tell me anything because I, but, you know, because I already found the flag, right? So that's, so, um, but that's how I make a program runnable. So, and, and lots of reverse engineering challenges, you know, you can, you can, Sometimes just running it, you see what it does, and then there may be some way to, to, to you know, to make it do something weird by like, you can fuzz, you can fuzz the program. So you can, fuzzing, so this is where you dump in a bunch of random data in any input strings to try to make it fail ungracefully and, and give you some information. Um, okay, I'm gonna, I'm gonna stop there. Um, there's, a, there's a cool walkthrough in here. Um, okay, there's a brief introduction to Ada, Ada Pro in here that you can look at. There's a, um, there's a walkthrough of a buffer overflow, so you can do a no kidding hands-on buffer overflow. And um, that is, is in these slides. I'm gonna upload these in a few minutes. Forensics challenges are um, challenges where, um, you know, it's, it's you, you, have some, you have some bit of information and you have to sort of follow the trail of clues. And, oh, uh, I'm sorry, forensics is, is a digital artifact, right? Digital artifact, um, and I don't have any forensics challenges in this, in this particular uh, workshop CTF, but there are some forensics challenges in the conference CTF, so you should look at those, and uh, there might be some interesting stuff in there. Reconnaissance challenges um, are, are um, lots of problem solving, right? Usually it's, it's some trail of clues and the best resource for um, most reconnaissance challenges is, is Google. You just have to, you just have to um, search around until you find uh, you know, some, some breadcrumb that'll get you to where you need to be. Okay, all right. So I'm going to switch over to the CTF system. So, um, what questions? Anybody have any questions on, on the things that we sort of walk through? Um, I, I want to spend a few minutes showing the, the admin functionality of the Cloud CTF system. So I'm going to do that. If there are any questions, please put them in the Q&A section or, or in the chat and we'll come back to them. So I'm, I'm logged in here as a um, I'm logged in here as a player, right? So I'm on Firefox here, logged in as a player. Um, I'm going to go to my, uh, I'm going to go to um, Chrome. Here on Chrome, I'm logged in as an admin. So let me show you what the difference is. So you can compare this experience to the experience that you're, that you're having. So the basics are very similar, right? You have a menu across the top. So I'm in the challenges section. So I see the challenge categories. Um, I can see uh, my own team. And since we're playing solo, you're only going to see yourself. If you're if if you had if I had this set up to have teams, then you would see all the players in your team listed here. There's a scoreboard. So here I see um, lots of scoring going on. Awesome! It's fantastic. 320 must be the must be the high end, huh? Okay, now now I, let me. I'm going to go back to the challenges section here. So, so here's how I here's how I edit and add challenges. I'm going to select a challenge. So I'm going to select this one, Caesar, my Caesar. So this this looks very similar to what you see as a player, right? I can I can solve the challenge, but um, but maybe I want to edit the challenge. Maybe I want to um, add a hint. Okay, so here's the challenge. Here's where I edit it. I can change the name of the challenge. I can change the description. 
I can change the points. I can change the flag. So here I have the flag as a string. And when I put this in here as a string, I, the, when somebody types in the string, it has to match exactly. Now this allows me to put in multiple correct answers, right? So I might, I might think that um, uh, somebody might capitalize some of this stuff, right? They might say, I came, I saw, I conquered. Okay, maybe I, maybe I can imagine that somebody would type it in that way or they would, you know, have some diff slightly different, um, they might capitalize the very beginning of it or whatever. So I can put in multiple strings and have multiple different correct answers. And if what the person types in matches any one of these, it's going to be a match and they're going to get the points. Um, <clears throat> what I can also do is I can put in these things called regular expressions. And um, I'm not going to go very far down the regex uh, path, but um, if, you, if you know regular expressions or if you're willing to take a little time and learn about regular expressions, there are some, there are some very simple regular expressions you can use that will do, instead of matching an identical string, it'll do some pattern matching. So for example, here's a regular expression. I put in a slash, I put in the thing, I put in a slash, and then I put in an I, after the slash, I put in an, an I, and what that I says is it says ignore case. So I could have all caps, or I could have any combination of uppercase and lowercase, as long as it's this string of letters in this order, that, dot, that, that I after the slash is going to ignore the case. And then if I put in a G, that's going to find that, that series of characters and letters of any case anywhere in the thing that I entered as the flag. So I could put in a whole bunch of characters, but as long as that sequence appears somewhere in my response, that is going to, um, that's going to uh, match. And, and the reason I might use that is because sometimes you see flags that are of this format. They'll say flag, and then they'll have, you know, I came, I saw, I conquered, and then they'll have the close bracket. And really all you care about is this part, right? This stuff is superfluous. This, this just indicates to the player that they actually found the thing. If I use that slash and then the thing and then the I and then the G, it's gonna match this. If you, if you put in this whole thing, it's gonna match this. Or if you just put in this, it's gonna match that. So regular expressions can be very powerful if you know how to use them. <clears throat> okay, so that's the, that, so I'm on, I'm, I'm on the edit challenge window here and I'm at the very, very, very first window. If I go down to the, um, to the paper clip on the edit challenge uh, pop up, here I can add an artifact. So if I, have a, if I have either a link or a file, I can add artifacts to the challenge. And I can add multiple artifacts. So I can add multiple files, multiple links, whatever I want. And those will show up when the person clicks on the file, like those PCAPs, that's where you see that. I can also add hints. So I can put in a message like, um, it's a Caesar cipher, exclamation. And then I can say, that'll cost you one point. And so if somebody, if somebody can't, you know, if, if somebody wants to take the hint, they click, I'll confirm that. Now I've changed that challenge, right? So if I click there, and you, if you, if you guys haven't solved this, so now there's a hint, right? It says, um, I can, I can get this hint for one point. And the hint says, oh, it's a Caesar cipher. No kidding. So, um, and the way the hints work is that's going to detract from your score as soon as you, as soon as you take the hint. So it doesn't detract from the points that you'll get from the challenge. It's going to, it's going to take those points from you right away when I take a hint. And um, if I don't have any points, I can't get any hints. Or if I don't have enough points and the hints cost more than the points I have, then I can't, then I can't um, do the hints. All right, let me go back into this challenge because there's still some things I can edit. I'm gonna go to the edit button again. <clears throat> okay, so I looked at this page. I looked at the uh, artifacts and hints page. There's advanced settings, so I can enable this or not. So I can, if I, if I uncheck this, it's not enabled. So it still shows up for me as the administrator, like this apple, apple, apple one. But there's this red eyeball with a slash through it. 
that means it's there, but it's not enabled. So I might turn on and off different challenges. And then like if I might have some additional challenges lined up, for example, and if my students are doing really well, then I'll, then I'll make them visible. Or if they're not doing well, then I'll just leave them. Um, so I can enable challenges or not. I can specify the category. This is where I specify the category. And so here in this CTF, the categories are simply, you know, these, these five things. If I just, I, I can select from the list or I can put, I can put in a new category. So I could say here, new category. And if I do that, we'll see what happens here in a minute when I do that. I can put in the max number of attempts. So most of the, these have a max number of attempts of 100. If I only wanted people to be able to guess twice, I can put in a two there. And so I'm going to let them try twice, and then they're not going to be able to try it anymore. And then there are tags. I can tag these challenges. I can, I can tag them with the KUs and KSAs from the nice workforce framework list. And we have them all linked here. Or I can put in a tag that says, this is a beginner challenge. If I want to have, if I want to tag my challenges, and and I'll I'll show you in a minute where these tags come into play. You can search. You can search. We have a library of challenges, and you can search on these tags. Okay, let me go here. So I changed the category here to new category. Now I'm going to click confirm. And what happens when I do that? You see that that challenge disappeared out of the crypto tab. And now it shows up all by itself in this new category tab. So I can, I can change, that's how, I, that's how I create new categories is I can, um, I, I, I do that uh, on, on, the, on here. Okay, so that's, that's how you modify a challenge. Here's how, I, here's how I add a new challenge. There's a, there's a plus, sign in the upper right hand corner here. So this is pretty consistent with our other with our other Virginia Cyber Range pages, right? If I want to add, um, you know, if, if I have some administrative functionality, then the, then the buttons are in the upper right hand corner. So um, if I click add a challenge, I can, I can add a challenge from scratch. So I can put in all the stuff, right? And there's some mandatory fields, there's got to be a name, there's got to be a description, there's got to be points, there's got to be a flag. Uh, I think that might be it. I think these are the only mandatory things. If you, if you don't put in a category, it's going to have a category called uncategorized. Um, so, so I can create a new challenge going through all those basic steps, or I can add a challenge from the library. Hmm, how about that? So I can go here and I can search. So I might want to find beginner challenges, for example. I might want to find beginner crypto challenges. And here are some beginner crypto challenges. And so the beginner, th these are challenges that are in, that have the crypto category and they have a, and they have a beginner tag in them. So that last pant, that last uh, uh, CTF, um, well, I'll show you where that is. Okay, so I'm, I just open one up and I'm gonna say next. And when I do that, here's the challenge and I can edit this however I want. And I can uh, add more artifacts. I can um, enable or disable. I can change the number of attempts. And here's where there's a here's where there's this tag, right? This one has the beginner tag. So when I did a search on beginner, that's why that's why this this challenge came up because it has this tag associated with it. So that's the library. And there's a, and and um, we have a CTF challenge library that has I don't know how many 100, 150 or so challenges to choose from. Okay, so that is challenge manipulation as the CTF admin. Here's the other thing you can do as the CTF admin. There's an admin um, menu item now across the top here. And so, so if, if I'm a teacher in a course in the cyber range and I provision one of these, once we turn it on, so we're gonna turn this on in, in August. If I'm a teacher in a course and I provision one of these, then I'm the administrator. The teacher is the administrator. So when I log in, I see all these administrator functions. When the students log in, they, they don't see any of these administrative functions. Okay, so um, as the admin, I have a new menu here. So I have some basic settings. This, set, this CTF is scheduled to start uh, today at, uh, start at 9.30 this morning. It's, it's uh, set up to stop in about 10 minutes. I'll go ahead and, I'll, I'll go ahead and make this, make, I'll, I'll make it available um, until tomorrow at noon. So this is up until tomorrow at noon. So if you want to walk through any of those challenges that we didn't get to in the workshop, then then um, 
please um, go ahead and do that and this thing will still be available to you. Um, okay, so settings, I can, I can change the name. That's what shows up on the splash screen. I can set when the CTF starts, I can set when it ends. I can allow public registration. So I gave you guys a link to log in here. I gave you the, the vacro.io slash thing and, and that's a shortcut for this link up here. So all of these CTFs have this URL of some uh, long cryptographic string dot CTF dot Virginia cyber range dot org. And um, normally you're not going to use that. Your students are going to get to the CTF through your course. And if, if you're, if the students are getting to the CTF through your course, then you don't need to turn on public registration because there's going to be nobody outside your course who's playing in the CTF. Since this CTF is open to whoever wanted to come in and play, whoever wanted to join the workshop, I turned on public registration and that allowed you to create your own account. When your students play the CTF, if they come in through your course, which is the expected method, if they're in your class, they come in through your course, they click on the CTF exercise environment in the Virginia Cyber Range, and then they click on the, the uh, you know, they, they, that'll bring up the CTF. If they do that, then you don't need to allow public registration. There's gonna be nobody coming in from outside. If I, um, if I put, if I click allow players to change teams, this turns on the team functionality. So if I do that, then um, then uh, students then when when I come in when somebody comes in, instead of just having the play solo option, they'll also have an option to create a team or to join a team. And you can turn this on for for either CTFs associated with your course or for external CTFs. Um, down here, I can change the theme. So there's the default theme. So if I change the theme. <clears throat> Now, now if now if all you did a reload, if you all, if you do if you do a reload right now, you're going to get this. Your your theme is going to change to this. <clears throat> and um, if I go back to the simple theme, you got to reload quick. So I'm going to turn it back. I just turn it back. Okay. So now if you reload again, you're going to get this simple theme, right? So that so there, so we have themes, and there'll be more themes later on. Right now, we only have two two the two very basic themes. Okay, the players, if I click on the players tab, I see all the players in the CTF. So here I see that there are uh, 33 folks in here right now, and I can delete players, I can edit players, I can promote players to admin. So if you had like a, a CTF team in your school and you wanted one of your students to be able to add or delete challenges or modify the CTF, you could promote one of your students to being a CTF admin. Teams, here you can manipulate teams so you can move students onto different teams. Right now we each have our own team, so that's not very interesting, but, um, but the Teams tab lets you, um, lets you move students around on teams or you can see who's on which teams. And I can see, let's see, I can look at the scores for an individual team. And what this will show me is if I had teams turned on, I could see who solved, I could see the, the person who solved each one of these challenges, the individual player. And so that might be interesting if you if you want to put your students into teams, or you, but you want to see which individual actually solved the challenges, then that's how you do that. Statistics tells me um, uh, this just gives me a challenge by challenge list of um, successful and, and failed attempts on each challenge. Um, interesting. Uh, so yeah, this might be useful to you. And then oh, and then okay, so this is. Um, so uh, in the admin section, there's a, there's a tab called library. This lets you as an, as a, as an admin in the, in the cloud CTF, so you as a teacher in a Virginia school, you can create your own library of challenges. And so here I've created my own library. So this is separate from that, this is separate from that big library. This is my own library. And so if I'm going to add challenges to a CTF, I always add them to my library first. So this works the same way. I put in the, all the details about the challenge and then I confirm it. And then now when I, when I import a challenge from a library, I'm not going to go back here out here and show you. When I import a challenge from a library, the library is going to show me all of the global challenges and it's going to show me all of my library challenges. And the way I tell the difference is, it's got this little person next to it. It's a, it's a, it's on my, um, it's on my, um, 
It's in my library. There's also a way to, sh to share challenges amongst your organization. So you can have, so there's organization libraries, there's libraries at different levels and you can share stuff. And um, there's, there's a whole bunch of KB articles that are gonna come out soon that explain all those kinds of, all those kinds of needs. Um, <clears throat> okay, so any questions on any of that? That's that's the that's behind the curtain, right? That's how you manage this thing. Um, okay, and it and it's noon, so um, so I think I covered what I wanted to cover, and um, I thank you for joining me. This was this I always you know I, I do this CTF workshop occasionally uh, in different events, and I'll do it. I'll probably do it for the nice K twelve conference this year. I've, I've um, with the Virginia Cyber Range is going to provide the conference CTF for the nice K twelve conference. So if you, if you are gonna go to the NICE K-12 conference, you might see some of these CTF challenges again that you saw, that you see in the conference CTF. I'll just warn you up front, that's a thing, right? Because we only have so many challenges. And we're not gonna, I'm not sure how many more we're gonna be able to create before then. But um, I'll do another version of this uh, um, CTF workshop for that conference, uh, probably a very similar version. Um, 